Lucifer's pecs in this episode are just, they're what I dream of. Tarek Profiles Podcast, episode 75, recorded February 2023. This is the Trek Profiles Podcast, where each episode we meet a Star Trek fan, we discuss their fandom, and we try to figure out why Star Trek matters to us so much. I'm John, your intrepid host of this whole enterprise, and I welcome you to this, the Trek Profiles Podcast, episode 75. If you wish to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at feedback at trekprofiles.com or on Facebook or Twitter at Trek Profiles. Warning, as we recorded this, it was just before the premiere of Star Trek Picard Season 3, so all previous Trek content up to and including that point is fair game and may be discussed during this episode. You have been warned, humans. As always, my trusty sidekick and co-host is the tacitly traditional, tolerably telegenic, but never tendentious M5 computer. M5 activated. M5, let's do the housekeeping. Announcements and housekeeping ready. This is an independent program. If you'd like to support us, the best way to do that is just to follow us wherever you're getting your audio. We're on all the major platforms, and your following us helps other Trek fans find us. There are some lightly edited outtakes and bonus material at the end of this episode. They will come after the ending audio cards. Enjoy them, or not, as you choose. At the end of every episode, my guest faces my Kobayashi Maru lightning round. They get five terrible, multiple-choice Star Trek questions, and then they must give us their answer. After each episode drops, I tweet those questions out as polls where you can have your say. Let's look at the questions from episode 73 with guest Rob Hedrick and see how it went. Question 1, cuteness factor overload, the Cation orphan kitty from Prodigy or Lorca's Tribble. Rob selected the Tribble, but in the poll, they were all about that cat no Tribble by 82 to 18%. Question 2, worst surprise for your away team, Dreadnought, the Crystalline Entity, or Gorn Hatchlings. Both Rob and the listeners selected the Gorn Hatchlings. The poll was 63 for them, 34 for the Crystalline Entity, and 3 for Dreadnought. Question three, make your own Star Trek Freaky Friday. Who are we going to body swap? The choices were Uhura and Scotty, Riker and LaForge, or Bashir and O'Brien. Again, Rob and the audience were in agreement that it would be Bashir and O'Brien. They got 64% in the poll with 23 for Riker and LaForge and Uhura, Scotty getting only 13%. Question four, which dead captain do we miss the most? Garrett, Robau, or Esteban? Captain Garrett won the poll with 50%, Robau was in second place with 36 and Esteban was in third with 14%. If you had a chance to listen to the episode, Rob did a great pitch for the rehabilitation of Esteban, but it wasn't enough to sway most of you, that's for sure. And finally, question five. Choose the best Picard line from these. The sky's the limit. The line must be drawn here. The first duty of every Starfleet officer is to the truth. And it's possible to commit no mistakes and still lose. That is not weakness, that is life. And for the third time in this round of Kobayashi Maru, Rob and all of you were in agreement. You both agreed on the line about committing no mistakes, which got 57% in the poll. The line must be drawn here, got 20%. The first duty got 14 and the sky's the limit got 9 Now, if you enjoyed those questions and would like to take a stab at writing your own for possible inclusion in the show, send them to me at feedback at trekprofiles.com or DM me on Twitter. And that's enough of that. M5, let's get to the show. Commencing show transmission. His favorite character is Mirror Spock, and he loves the Thasians from Charlie X. His favorite ship is the Facerius, home of super smart man baby Clint Howard. He's from Chicago, North America, Earth, in Sector 001. It's Mark McGinnis. Welcome, Mark, and thank you for being on the podcast. Hey, John. Thank you so much for having me. I am uh, very excited to be here. So, Mark, this is one of my occasional series with brand new Star Trek fans. So this is going to be a really interesting conversation. I'm really excited to talk to you. And so let's go right to question one, which is, are you a Star Trek fan? I must confess, I am a Star Trek fan. Now, how long have you been a Star Trek fan? So I've been a Star Trek fan uh, beginning about midway through last year. Uh, Strange New Worlds was my gateway. And then before I knew it, I had devoured the original series, the animated series, the first six movies, and currently am very much enjoying the next generation. 
Oh, now this is very interesting to me. So you said Strange New Worlds is your gateway. So you started your viewing of Star Trek with Strange New Worlds. That's the first Star Trek you saw? That is the first Star Trek that I saw with the the mindset, I suppose you could say, that I have now. I was always aware of Star Trek, but that was the first time I really sat down and made a conscious effort to to watch and engage, and uh, and I really connected with the show. All right, this is very interesting. So Strange New Worlds, of course, is on a streaming service. Correct. So were you a subscriber before this? Because I think a lot of Star Trek fans think that like that's why people subscribe to Paramount Plus is because or whatever they call it now because they want to have Star Trek, right? So how did you even end up with a subscription? How did how did this happen? So now I've already confessed I'm a Star Trek fan. Now I have to confess that I am a Halo fan. So I'm a big uh, video game fan, uh-huh. and the Halo show came out on Paramount Plus. So that was actually in a way my gateway into Star Trek. I had watched the Halo show and. Uh, you know, I still got a couple weeks free of the trial or whatever promotion I signed up on. And it was as simple as, hey, you might like Strange New Worlds. And that was kind of the point where I thought, oh, I've always known about Star Trek. I've seen a couple episodes here and there. Eh, whatever, it's a Thursday night. I got nothing going on. Began the first episode and I was hooked. So Halo, in a way, was my gateway from being a video game nerd to becoming a Star Trek nerd. So I understand that the reaction to the Halo show was quite negative. I've never seen it, although I did actually play the game a long time ago, and I don't really know what the particular parameters of the outrage are, but but I did become aware that there's a lot of negative reaction to the Halo show. Um, is that is that true, whether you, you yourself liked it or not? I would say that is very accurate. This is actually a really interesting uh, question or interesting point that you bring up. You know, a lot of times whenever I engage with any sort of media or music or books or movies, I personally find it easier to segregate things I like versus they, what I don't like. Even with, you could say, an overall general negative reaction to the Halo show, I like to consider myself an optimist. I can always find things to enjoy in it. So there were some really cool things. There were a lot of things I really didn't care for. But you know what? Like most things in life, it's about perspective. And uh, I just... Choose not to let those negative things bother me too much. Overall, I would give it maybe a 6 out of 10, but it was certainly enough uh, great action, some good acting to keep me through. I probably will be watching season two because, hey, I'm stuck with Paramount because of Star Trek at this point anyway. All right. Well, let's bring it back to Star Trek then. So enough about Halo. Let's do it. So I'm curious, what did you know about Strange New Worlds? I mean, I'm sure by now you figured out that it was a prequel show, but it comes after the Discovery show. So it's kind of a prequel, but not... Um, how did you sort of, when you were watching the show, how did you figure out like what was happening in the vast, uh, tapestry of the Star Trek universe? By the way, that's a pun that longtime fans will get, uh, that you will too, probably when you get to like season seven of next gen. I had absolutely no context. I had no idea that it was a prequel or anything like that. Um, I was surprised to see Spock in the show because he is very much a cultural icon that transcends Star Trek. So obviously I know Spock. Um, I even knew Data before uh, in The Next Generation and Kirk and Picard. I actually did not know McCoy, but we'll get to that. But so seeing the Spock character in Strange New Worlds was kind of my first tip off that this was treading some sort of familiar ground. But I really had no other concept as to where it fit into the timeline. At that point, I didn't know if it was connected to the new movies that had come out. Um with the the J.J. Abrams produced movies, which I've I've seen the first couple now. Mm -hmm. So I really just watched it and was able to go in blind. And a lot of times that's kind of the the way I choose to to dig in and enjoy things. It was really only after the fact when I had watched everything. And it was in particular the, the season finale. So, hey, spoilers inbound here. But I realized I was missing something. And once I got to Balance of Terror in the original series, that's when I realized it was a play on the, the um original episode and so even without knowing what balance of terror was just the season finale of strange new worlds was kind of my really big red flag uh kirk showing up uh that hey this fits into a larger mythology that i'm completely blind to and that was the point when i thought okay it's it's time to to dig in and kind of see what all the all the fuss is about and now now i'm here confessing my my fandom so you've seen the whole first season of Strange New Worlds, and then what happened next? Mm-hmm. What did you decide to watch after that? All right, so this is going to sound crazy. I watched all of Strange New Worlds, 
And I wasn't really sure where to get into the original series. Um, it seems obvious now. Just go back, start episode one. But there's movies, there's multiple TV shows. I didn't know how it all connected. One thing I uh, did Many of the fans don't know that either, by the way, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, on. Well, good. I, I feel much better. What I did know was Wrath of Khan. I knew that that was something special. So believe it or not, I finished Strange New Worlds and I skipped the motion picture and I watched Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. <laughs> and I will, uh, I actually just rewatched Wrath of Khan now post seeing everything else. And I mean, it, the first time I watched it, even with no context, it was a nine out of 10 movie. Watching it again, and understanding that so much of the value of the movie, or at least my enjoyment, was the character growth, the character moments. Having spent so much time with the crew of the Enterprise, uh, immediately elevated it in 10 out of 10 now. So yeah, I watched uh, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, and then I wanted to know what's going to happen in the search for Spock. So then I had to watch Star Trek Three. I watched Star Trek Four, Five, Six, And uh, meanwhile, I was starting to kind of work my way through the original series episodes. Uh, I travel a lot for my job. So a lot of times I'm watching movies on an airplane, on my phone and things like that, maybe catching an episode in between and things like that. So I kind of went through this really strange order. Started with Wrath of Khan, probably watched a, a good chunk of season one, then, then season three, sorry, then Star Trek three, search for Spock, few more episodes. And it really all kind of became this weird amalgamation. Um, and then the last thing I watched is I came full circle. And the last bit of the original series I watched was actually the motion picture. And then, of course, after that, I had to watch Wrath of Khan again. And that was just this past weekend. That, that's wild. That's wild. Now, what's interesting, mm -hmm. by the way, just so you know this. Uh, so I'll just take a moment and explain some of this. I will probably cut this out of the episode. You realize you're watching the remastered episodes of, of original series. Yes. Okay, Correct. so those are not the original effects in a lot of cases, and and there's a lot of things that have been fixed, right? And in fact, the motion picture, I think, uh, I, I depending, I have to check now, but I think that's actually been the the remaster that came out just last year. So they did a total remaster on that one too, added a few effects, tightened up the editing a little bit, moved some things around, so it's it's a little bit different than the, than the theatrical version. So just if you ever run across that, just so you know, um, those are like a little mm -hmm. different, but I think they're all improvements. Yeah, I do believe the one I watched was the director's cut as well. And uh, I mean, I thought it looked fantastic. Uh, so stunning even. And I know that movie was very big on effects, especially in comparison to the other ones, uh, but I still enjoyed it all the same. Okay, so you've seen Strange New Worlds, you worked your way through TOS, you looked at a bunch of the TOS movies. What happened next? So then uh, the next logical conclusion was the animated series. So oh, very I'm logical. A, it, total, total. <laughs> very logical. So yeah, uh, jumped right in. You know, I grew up watching a lot of older cartoons. So even with the, the kind of stilted animation, the let me put it this way. When you binge watch the animated series, you realize that the episodes are 95% all the same exact uh, frames and things like that, just with different dialogue. But I actually really enjoyed it. I thought it held up very well. It was a very condensed version of TOS, uh, in my opinion. So, yeah, that was kind of the, the next logical pathway for me because I wanted more of, of Kirk, McCoy, Spock, Uhura, Sulu. I really became attached to that crew in a way that I was actually concerned. I was not going to connect with the TNG crew, although I'm very much enjoying them for different reasons. But... I became extremely attached to the crew, so I knew that they were going to be in it in the animated series, started there. And then right after that, that's when I watched the first two of the J.J. Abrams reboot movies. I have not seen the third just yet. Very different take, but again, I, I'm, I have my crew now. I know my crew. I want to see my crew. I want to see the adventures they go on. Oh, that's glorious. Yeah, those, those are called the Kelvin films, by the way. Uh, because the Kelvin the, films, thank yeah, you. The, the Kelvin timeline, so that's because that's the first ship that we see in the beginning of the first film that gets blown up, right, with the the bald captain, mm -hmm. right, and all that. So anyway, yeah, those are the the, the Kelvin films. Um, I, I I love them. I think they're great. 
Um, very different take on on Star Trek, of course, and so much lens yes. flare, so much lens flare. Oh my god! Um, but anyway, <laughs> I thought there was something wrong with my TV, so I'm glad that you said that. I was just <laughs> watching this thing, and it was hard to to put my finger on it for a while. Um, so I'm very glad that you said that. Thank you. Yeah, no, they they love the lens flare in those. So, uh, and now you're working your way through TNG season one. That is correct. Yeah, I just wrapped up. Don't even remember the name, but it is the the arranged marriage with uh, Deanna, um, the planet Haven. It might be called Haven, but I, I just right, right, finished right. that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's probably about episode 10 or so in, in the first season. So initial reactions to TNG? I, I very much enjoy it. Um, there have been some absolute banger episodes that really caught me off guard. I know this wasn't necessarily in my my notes or anything ahead of time mm -hmm. but the episode where first of all q is glorious uh i was glad to see him show up again he's shown up twice in the pilot episode and when he tempts Riker with his powers yeah i actually i tremendously enjoyed that episode and we're gonna really dig into it but i have noticed from the the common themes in the episodes that i chose to discuss today it always comes back to justifying humanity's existence in a universe that we don't understand or looking at the human traits that could be twisted as weaknesses, things like compassion, shame, guilt, power, corruption, and turning those concepts into really interesting storylines that take place in this vast universe of the galaxy, um, it, it kind of hits on both that macro and micro level of wondering those those big questions of why and then really focusing in on those inherent human qualities that we all experience. It's all part of the, the human condition. And I think that TNG episode was a really great example of that. Overall, really, really enjoy it. Uh, favorite characters off the bat. Uh, LaForge is great. Data is a riot. Mm -hmm. I'm actually very impressed with how little redundancy there is between the characters where obviously there's shades of Spock in data. I can say yeah. Picard is not that similar to Kirk. Actually, uh, so far, I don't think he's much like Kirk at all. And I mean that in a good way. Although I love Kirk, he's still going to be my captain. But they really, they really did a fantastic job of adjusting the character dynamics to create characters that feel a little bit more, I suppose, human would be the word, uh, nuanced, layered, mm -hmm. as opposed to TOS, where, you know, you have McCoy on one side, you have Spock on the other, and Kirk kind of trapped in the middle. There are a lot more interesting and layered dynamics across the crew in TNG, and I'm tremendously enjoying it. And the aesthetics, uh, even though I watched the remastered TOS, it, it looks great. It's great to see the Enterprise again. Love the effects. A um, little bit more modern. I, I love the uniforms. Huge, huge hit on the uniforms. Oh, the uh, the, the the spandex onesies is what they're wearing. Yes. And, and I was going to say when I, um, with the motion picture, that, <laughs> when I saw those uniforms, the weird one piece with the shoes attached to the the uniforms that they wear, I was very concerned. I didn't really remember how any of the uniforms looked in TNG. And I was like, oh, I hope this is not a premonition of, of what we're running into. But, you know, luckily when I'd seen Wrath of Khan in the later movies, I love those uniforms and I, and I love the TNG uniforms as well. So one of the things I will advise you on is that I think the runway is very clear from TNG because TNG goes directly into Deep Space Nine, which goes directly into Voyager. And you can drop in Enterprise, I think, at any point along the way because enterprise is a prequel that's even a prequel before discovery and strange new worlds it's it's before uh the federation so it's it's earth's first warp five vessel going into space and it's all about that so so you can put that in anywhere but but it's generally tng and then deep space nine and then voyager is kind of the the way you would go enterprise was produced after that but i think you could watch it anywhere some people might disagree with me on that that's okay but you got lots of star trek left <laughs> while, while I have you, let me ask your advice. Where do the later movies fit in? Because I don't even know where and when to watch those. I know there's yeah Federation's movie, and then there's several more films with the TNG crew. 
I believe that was after TNG, but does it fit into Deep Space Nine? I know there was some sort of crossover, but you know, again, I'm mm. I'm trying to do my best to go in in blind. Okay, but, uh, so, a little okay. guidance, great. Here's a little bit of Star Trek archaeology for you. Let's do it. That Deep Space Nine was very much the creation of of one guy. Um, and I'm, I'm really simplifying and I, I realize it's almost unfair of me to say that. So I, I do apologize, but uh, it was this guy, Ira Stephen Bear was the guy who was really in charge of Deep Space Nine. And I think that a lot of, um, a lot of the other creatives involved in Star Trek have been hesitant to mess with Deep Space Nine, uh, because it's almost like you're messing sort of with Ira's thing, whereas the mm -hmm. rest of them were just much more collaborative. And this is coming out so wrong because it's really not true. And I'm almost being unfair. But I, I think some of the creatives have actually said things similar to this. Um, and so there's not a lot of Deep Space Nine that happens after Deep Space Nine. Uh, but what I would recommend is finish TNG and then you can jump right into those TNG movies because there's even like a crossover TNG film that happens like where you have Captain Kirk and Captain Picard in the same film and that's all mm -hmm. I'll say about it, right? It's not a spoiler. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of, I, it's generation. I, I am aware yeah, I am aware of that much. So, yeah. And, you know, and I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, I have also read the autobiography of James T. Kirk. So that is uh, what I, we were talking about episodes. So I do know Kirk's eventual fate. Uh, very much enjoyed that that book. Um, and it did cover a couple things uh, like generations that I wasn't completely knowledgeable of. But it was a great way to kind of have a, a fun little romp through that that TOS era. And I'm a big reader as well. So, you know, if I get tired of watching something that I'm going to read, hey, here's a Star Trek book. Might as well dive right in. So I do have a little bit of foreknowledge about the movie Generations. And beyond that, not so much else. Finish TNG. And that's my advice. Finish TNG. And then you can watch all the rest of the, the films uh, if you want. You can watch that third Kelvin film anytime you want. Uh, but I would say pretty much go with TNG, then Deep Space Nine, and then Voyager. Now, one of the weird things, and I guess you can you can have this as an option. If you search around online, you will find that there are people who watch rewatch Star Trek in star date order. Meaning that <laughs> that you have to realize that because Deep Space Nine there's elements of Deep Space Nine that involve the Enterprise. There's elements of Voyager that involve Deep Space Nine. So some of these shows are happening in a similar chronology. And so you can watch all of TNG, all of Deep Space Nine, all of Voyager in that order, or you could actually watch them in Stardate order and say like, okay, this episode of Deep Space Nine is happening at about the same time as this episode of Voyager. Uh, or you could actually watch them in episode release order, which of course is how those of us who were watching Star Trek back in the day actually watched it, right? This particular week, these two episodes of Star Trek were released because Deep Space Nine and Voyager were on at the same time. You know, they overlap. They weren't on exactly at the same time, but they did overlap. So you can have all these different options in front of you. A lot of that's confusing. Um, I don't think it's necessary because especially with the pre-streaming era Star Trek, I, I, even though people will tell you that there's parts of it that are serialized, it is not as serialized as people want to think it is in their heads. Um, it, it, you can you can tune into the most heavily serialized parts of Deep Space Nine, which is the most serialized, and make sense of an episode without having seen anything before it, uh, because it was designed that way. Uh, because it had to be, because it was in syndication. So it's not like the streaming era. Like, no one starts Game of Thrones with episode eight, you know, in season three. I mean, it just doesn't work that way. You know, you kind of just... Eh. Watch them yeah, and, and you absolutely hit on one of the things that really resonated with me about the show, that ability to go back and kind of have that that adventure of the week. Uh, I, I really enjoy that um, as much as, you know, I'll get into the, the new Game of Thrones. My favorite show of all time is probably Twin Peaks. Uh, okay. And that was kind of the start of that, that serialized ongoing drama, Who Killed Laura Palmer. But consequently, I'm also a huge fan of The X-Files, which I grew up watching as well. Hey, new monster of the week. And so being able to have sort of those compact stories is is tremendously enjoyable. And I think that is actually what really caught me with Strange New Worlds is I didn't know, am I am I bracing myself for a, you know, a long ride through these 10 episodes? Am I going to be engaged for all 10 episodes with the same story, the same characters? But instead, it really kind of followed that same pattern of here's the adventure of the week. And I, I it really resonated with me. And that was one of the reasons I 
was just ready to keep going and watch one after another. Oh, that's great. So we'll see how I fare with Deep Space Nine. I, I would say there's no there's no wrong answers to any of this. And I would say just, you know, put on the episodes and just go straight through. TNG, definitely not serialized, really, hardly at all. Um, Voyager has some sort of thematic serialization. There's sort of characters change a little bit over the course of the series. And it's good to see that, but you know, and and there is kind of a continuing story, but they were very loosey goosey with it. Um, Deep Space Nine is the most uh, serialized, I would say. And even that isn't that strong. So that that would be my advice. Just watch them in that order. TNG, finish up the movies if you want, and then watch Deep Space Nine and Voyager, and then watch the rest of the movies if you haven't seen them. And then you can put in Enterprise wherever you feel like. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I appreciate that. That's great. Now I got my whole roadmap out ahead of me. Yeah, and then you got to go back and got to finish. Uh, you got to do Discovery, and you got to do Lower Decks, nope. and you got to do Prodigy, and you got to do all that. All right, so I have another confession to make. I did watch the first episode of the Lower Decks. Okay. And I don't know, maybe I'm not that deep in where I just didn't really get it. I I got the sense it was a comedy, and I'm not trying to be negative, but I don't think I even so much as smirked the entire episode. And I just watched this thing, and it kind of ended, and I was like. All right, I, maybe I'm just not the the audience here. Um, I, I I have heard some people kind of compare it to shows like Rick and Morty, which I'm not really a fan of. So I don't know if it's just a disconnect there. So uh, I have seen one episode of The Lower Decks. I think I'm going to wait on it for a little bit uh, until I get to it. I definitely got the sense that there were references going over my head. Oh yeah, because I was so new to it. So I I think that. My enjoyment is very much going to to hinge on kind of really understanding it and getting all the references, the jokes, the puns, things like that. Because, yeah, the first time I watched it, I'm like, I'm just I'm not connecting with this and I'm definitely missing something on my end. Yeah, I, I think you're you're exactly right on that. I would wait until you've seen mostly everything uh, and then go back and look at Lower Decks. And I will tell you that there are longtime fans who miss a lot of stuff. And there are a couple of fans out there, and I, I'm not going to try to remember who it was to give them proper attribution, but there's a guy who posts on Reddit, and there's some people who post on, on Twitter, that after every Lower Decks episode, there's like, here's all the references you missed. And there's like, some of this stuff is like seven layers deep, you know, and you're just like, yeah. what in the world? You know, that like, oh, this thing like vaguely appeared in the background in this one episode, you know, of original series. And here it is now in Lower Decks. And they made a reference to this planet, which also appeared in this other episode. And I'm just, it's mind blowing. So yeah, there, there's a lot of that in there. And uh, I would say that, that Lower Decks improves uh, once you have seen a lot of other Star Trek. Plus it's, you know, hilariously goofy, which is also a big part of Sure. Star Trek, I think in a lot of ways. Yeah, a very different take. And so I'm, that's one of the strengths uh, of Star Trek is like that I've already found, even though I'm not that far in, but you can tell a lot of different stories, different types of stories, mysteries, horrors, dramas, thrillers. Like you can, you can do it all in Star Trek. And that's what kept every episode so exciting for me. Absolutely. Um, I would strongly recommend, too, that you can just jump right into to Prodigy. Uh, if you really wanted to. It's a different kind of animation. Uh, it's not a comedy, although it has some funny pits, just like a lot of the episodes do. But it has a lot of true-to-the-core Star Trek in it, you know, whatever that sort of means, uh, especially with the the later season. The, the season numbering's a little weird. They had kind of a season one, then a long pause, and then a season 1.5. So there's only been one season, mm-hmm. but it really felt like two. It's, it's so weird. But I would recommend diving into that too at any time. It has one of the characters from Voyager in it, but I, I don't think it's necessary to really necessarily follow the story of that character to get into Prodigy at all. Um, I, I think it's really quite sure. Cool. So, you know, that one you can sort of plug in anywhere uh, if you really wanted to, and I think you'd be just fine. But I will tell you on this show, I have had people who have started in like the weirdest places with the show <laughs> because, you know, I talk no to the lifers. Oh yeah, because I'll, I'll t- you know because the show came from syndication, right? So I will talk to lifers who will say things like, "Yeah, I started watching Star Trek in you know season two of Voyager because that's you know I turned ten and finally got a TV in my room, you know, and that's that's what was on, so that's where they started watching." So, you know, I, I I'm not a big believer in this viewing order business for Star Trek. Um, some people are, and sometimes fans like to get in arguments about it. Um, not <laughs> my thing, really. I, I'm aware that there's lots of different ways of doing it but whatever you do find what you enjoy it'll be just right for you and and on that note on on viewing order um 
again, failed to, to mention this earlier, but obviously when I started TOS, I was very confused because the first episode I watched was The Cage. Oh, dear. Yeah, so all of a sudden, now, that was also when a lot of pieces came together for me with Strange New Worlds, and then I pivoted right to The Cage. Now, I had no idea if The Cage took place before or after Strange New Worlds. I did have to do a bit of Googling, and correct me if I'm wrong, The Cage chronologically takes place before Strange New Worlds, and I believe the Strange New Worlds cast shows up in Discovery. That was about as deep as I looked into it before they had their own show. Is that correct? Before Strange New Worlds had their own show. Correct. Yeah, so what what happened, oh, uh, spoiler alert, uh, what happens is season one of Discovery ends with their ship meeting the Enterprise. And then and then Anson Mount as Pike and, and all of those characters are in Discovery season two. Mm-hmm. And a, a nice fan story, again, my listeners would, would know all this, uh, but a nice fan story is that the response was so overwhelmingly positive to Anson Mount as Pike, Rebecca Romaine as number one, who, by the way, was wasted in Discovery. They gave her like nothing to do, but she's, <laughs> people still loved her, um, but she's doing a lot more in Stranger Worlds, which is great. But there was such a positive reaction to, to that whole group that that really sort of willed Strange New Worlds into existence. You know, it, it really was yeah. like a fan thing, you know, in a lot of ways. I mean, no one could force CBS to do anything they don't want to do, but but they were looking for shows. And, you know, there was just a huge outcry of like more of this, please. <laughs> and that's what. Right. We got. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so it, it was very interesting to, to pivot back, start on the cage. And I don't have Kirk, who is one of the only recognizable characters I knew. And then all of a sudden, I'm seeing the same character from Strange New Worlds, a brand new show. So I just decided to keep going. And then um, eventually when I got to the Menagerie, that is when it all clicked together. And that was when I, I did a bit of Googling. And OK, the cage was the original pilot. And, and now I know the story behind it. But it was uh, it was what made Strange New Worlds an even more interesting entry point to go back to the beginning. And all of a sudden, hey, it's the same career I was just watching now in 2022, back in uh, 1966. Yeah, it's it. I I could see how you were confused. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I just I stayed the course and I just kept going because I was uh, I was pretty wrapped up in it. Now, how I found you was you had posted one of these like uh, how shall I describe it? An internet confession. Yes. Uh, that said. Uh, Hi, Star Trek nerds. Um, I am one of you now, and uh, I don't know how this happened exactly, but I'm here, and uh, I'm happy to be part of the club, and I confess that I'm a Star Trek fan. So what what induced you to go and make a confession uh, online in a Star Trek forum? I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that up, actually, because I know that was that was how we connected. And, you know, I am admittedly not, not terribly big on, on social media. I don't have a Facebook or anything. I have a YouTube channel and I go on Reddit. And what I love about Reddit is you can find communities of passionate individuals and people willing to converse, discuss, and help each other out. And it's a very charitable description of Reddit, by the way. Well, like I said, I try to look on the on the bright side. I want to see the positive. <laughs> Let me put it this way: the block button is there for a reason. There are certainly people who uh, they just don't have anything nice to say, and uh, you know what? Not my problem to deal with. So, yeah, I'm one of those people. I have no problem blocking uh, nasty people who, you know, we'll leave it at that. Try to try to always look on the bright side. Although, I mean, to that point, I also find that the smaller the community, usually the more passionate and positive it is. Now, Star Trek is not a small group by any stretch of the imagination, but I find that a lot of any sort of online toxicity, you know, things kind of settle at the bottom the larger a group is. So. I do think that a community like Star Trek or some smaller and more intimate communities, um, they can really have have positive influences. So again, looking on the bright side here. So the reason I made that post is, you know, this is the first time I'm actually really thinking about it or, or contextualizing it like this. I finished up TOS and I felt something. And, and, and sorry, I don't just mean TOS. I mean the first six movies, the animated series, and my time with my crew was was gone. I don't know if accomplishment is the right word because what did I do? I watched 
dozens of hours of television. Uh, um, so I, it, it's hard to call that an accomplishment, but I felt, I think bittersweet is probably the best way to describe it. And I actually held off on starting TNG because all of a sudden I'd found this show that really resonated with me in a way where you're watching a show that came out so long ago and it's as relevant today as ever. And there's very few shows like that, in my opinion. I have no problem watching older TV. I'm a big fan of Twilight Zone as well. I think that's another show that holds up tremendously well. Oh, yeah. Actually, for some of the same reasons uh, Star Trek does. So I had gone through Star Trek and gone through such a journey with some of these characters. And all of a sudden, I reached the end. And it was kind of, well, what's next? I know there's... There's other Star Trek, but there's not my Star Trek. I, I like this crew. I like McCoy. I like Spock. I like crew. I like this version of the Enterprise. I like this sort of retro aesthetic. It's actually, I love the backgrounds in the TOS, sort of that, I don't even quite know how to describe it, that sort of retro futuristic look. Yeah. Uh, very I vibrant know, colors, which, you know, very vibrant, yes. very colorful. Yeah. By the way, made to sell color TVs, by the way. That was no, no kidding. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what a time to be alive. I'm watching it in 4K on a 65-inch monitor or sometimes on my phone on an airplane. I mean, it's wild. <laughs> and so I had finished everything, and I just kind of felt, man, this is so dramatic to say, hey, it's a TV show. But it was like uh, an emptiness, but also proud. I don't know, proud of the enterprise, proud of the crew, proud of the journey. And I just felt like I needed to share it with someone. And that's why I posted it was kind of, hey, I, I just reached the end of a journey. I feel kind of weird. My crew is gone. I kind of have the great unknown in front of me, but here's my my record, my acknowledgement, and here I am now. And and that was, I think, also when I realized, like you said, it, it really was a confession. I didn't start out by saying, all right, I'm going to watch every bit of star trek that i can possibly watch quite frankly that is probably how this journey is going to end i'm going to end up watching <laughs> absolutely everything there is yes you will but yeah it's it's like eating an elephant you do it one bite at a time it was more like okay well this new show was really good wrath of khan what's that all about okay let's start there well now we gotta figure out what happens to spock okay these were good what's next what is this weird whale thing i still don't know how i feel about star trek 4 um it was a little bit off the nose for me. And then I went back through, all right, one more episode of TOS, one more episode. And then it just became a, a routine for me. You know, I, I like going to the gym and working out and I'm watching Star Trek on my cardio machines and it just became ingrained in my routines. And I'm a big fan of, of routines and I'm a creature of habit. So all of a sudden it was gone and I didn't really have anywhere else to turn to. And I think that's really the feeling that compelled me to, I don't know if it was necessarily reaching out, but sort of sharing my experience. And yeah, at the end, you know, it's an acknowledgement of, all right, I probably am in this for the long haul. Now I didn't realize how deep this went and I didn't realize how deep in it I already am until I ran out of things to watch and my crew's done. One of the things I'll see uh, among the, the longtime fans who've seen it all is that, uh, they get into collecting or going to conventions and stuff like that to sort of fill the fill the gap, you know. And and you've sent me a picture of yourself wearing a, a Star Trek shirt, so I, I see you have at least one item in your collection. Uh, ha have you bought anything else? I I don't have anything else Star Trek related. On second thought, that's not true. So first off, the the shirt uh, is a Star Trek three shirt, and it was because because of Reddit. I saw a post, hey, it's Star Trek Day, merchandise is off, and okay, let's check this out. Hey, you can get a Star Trek 3 shirt with Spock's face on it for $9. I always need new t-shirts to work out in, honestly. So cut the sleeves off, turn it into a workout tee, and, uh, and that was how I, I got my, my search for Spock shirt. I loved that movie. I would say I actually enjoyed it more than Wrath of Khan the first time uh, I watched Wrath of Khan after having seen Wrath of Khan again. And really going on that journey with the characters, it, Star Trek II hits way harder. And I would have to give Star Trek III another rewatch. But I do have, I already admitted I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a video game nerd. 
Uh, I do have a Star Trek The Next Generation game on the Game Boy. I still have that. It's oh. actually in the closet right behind me here. That is the other piece of Star Trek memorabilia that I have. And when we talk about sort of our experiences with it, I mean, it was a game I had when I was six years old. I didn't know any of the characters, but you got to fly around the little map and map out stars. And once in a while, you shoot your phasers, and that was it. No concept of anything else. So I have a Star Trek Game Boy cartridge that still works from my childhood, and I have my T-shirt. But that is about it from a, a memorabilia perspective. You can see in the room behind me here, I have you know a book collection behind me. I have some posters, but for the most part, I do try to manage my collections. I don't really collect anything necessarily. I'll get one or two things, but um, you know, I always try to kind of minimize it in that sense. So I am sure, actually, it's almost virtually a guarantee, I will collect more Star Trek memorabilia, but I don't actively uh, seek it out necessarily. Well, may I give you a couple of recommendations? I, I am all ears. I got my so, notepad ready. Th there was actually a, and this might be overstating it a little bit, but there was actually like a glory days of Star Trek video games sort of in the 90s. Okay. And if you go on to Memory Alpha, which is the, the main place where like all, that is like the main reference site for all things Star Trek, Memory Alpha. And if you look up some of those Star Trek video games from the 90s, you know, I bet some of them are still playable on systems in emulation mode. Um, there was like an Armada game, which was very popular. There was a Klingon game. I mean, there was, there was quite a few. And I want to say there's like four or five prestige titles from the 90s. So if, if you like retro gaming, Go check those out. And if you Absolutely. want something if you want something new, you know there's a Star Trek MMO. I did not know that actually. I'm learning <laughs> I'm so glad I'm on here. I'm learning all these these new pathways ahead of me. So all right, Star, Star Trek, Trek Online MMO, I'm writing it down. Star Star Trek Online is free to play. And uh, I, I played it a little bit. Um, I am a little bit of a gamer. And one of the things that I really like about it is you can sort of pick your era. So you can pick like a TOS character, or you can pick a TNG character, you can pick a Klingon, you can pick a Romulan, you can pick any kind of character you want. You know, they have a lot of different kinds. And it sort of starts in like a single player mode where you do some adventures that tie into some stuff. And then it like opens up and then there's more multiplayer stuff that happens after that. But it's free to play. So, you know, you can go check it. It's on Steam. You know, it's, it's in a lot of the places. I'm so if you're interested, go sold. check it out. Go check it out. Absolutely. You mentioned you like to read. There are a vast, vast, vast number of Star Trek novels. Vast. And Someone especially if you go back to my Yeah. If you go Sorry, back in the pocketbooks days, I mean, you know, especially if you read on your phone, you're looking for stuff like for Kindle app or something. I mean, you can go down a rabbit hole and just download so there's has to have been hundreds upon hundreds of them. And there was kind of a, a glory period of those sort of in the 80s and 90s with pocketbooks. And I, I mean, I, when I was much younger, I would go to Walden Books or B. Dalton's, which was the bookstores where I was at the time. And there would always be like five, six Star Trek novels on the shelf and always new, always telling some kind of weird story. And it's, many of it, much of it was not canonical. Uh, because they would mm -hmm. like totally, you know, do away with something that was a key point in that book, like in an episode, like, you know, three years later. But, um, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, you have lots of reading ahead of you. If you ever want to dip your toe into that. Yes. Yeah. I, uh, I, I mentioned I'm a, I'm a big Halo fan and again, have to give credit because it was my gateway here, but, um, in a really weird way, as, as much as I, I enjoy games and things like that, it's the Halo books that 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 hooked me. I don't know if you're even aware that there's a, a Halo book series. It's about 30 some odd novels and uh, some of the far better than they have any right to be for being mm. this sort of tie in with a video game. Authors like Greg Bear, who recently passed away, uh, acclaimed sci fi authors who are writing in this Halo universe. Um, yeah, Greg Bear is an legit. additional. Yes, yes. So he he wrote a, a a trilogy, and to this day, it's probably my favorite sci-fi trilogy called the Forerunner trilogy. I think even if you weren't aware of Halo, it takes place a hundred thousand years before the story. It is just some epic, high-level, uh, just out of this world stuff. And um, 
yeah, so I am definitely a big reader, and that has always been a gateway for me to kind of further engage with my interests and the things that I really enjoy. So it sounds like Star Trek is going to be no different. Because I did read a lot of Star Wars books growing up as well. So, uh, And I think in my response to that Reddit post that you mentioned, somebody sent me a list, and it was like legitimately 800 books or something like oh, yeah. that. <laughs> Star oh, Trek, yeah. and I was like, Wow, I really didn't know what I was getting into. You know, I'm I'm finishing up, uh, you know, Star Trek six and the, and the final episode. I think Turnabout Intruder of uh, season three, and then I wrap up the animated series. And it's like, okay, here are hours upon hours. If you want to uh, hang around with your your TOS crew, and uh, I, I'm absolutely planning to. One of the things that Star Trek is very well known for is this idea of Star Trek conventions. Now, before I ask you about any plans you may have to go to a convention, let me just say, what have you ever heard about Star Trek conventions? Just as like a person growing up in the United States, what, what I'm sure you'd heard of this, I think, that there are these nerd conventions. Um, what, what did you even think of them? Realistically, I, I, I didn't know much. I knew the term Trekkie. That's about the extent of it. Even as a guy who, I mean, goodness, I played Dungeons and Dragons, uh, read a lot of fantasy, play video games. I have a pretty big comic collection. I have never myself been to any sort of convention. Um, if I want to also pad out my, my geek credentials, I'm a huge pro wrestling fan as well, obviously. <laughs> and so, but, um, yeah, I, I really don't have much of a conception or sorry, I don't have much of a preconception regarding Star Trek conventions or anything like that. I, I yeah, unfortunately I don't have a great answer for you here. Um I know what a Trekkie is, but that's about the extent of my knowledge. So the only thing I'll say is I was talking with another guest and I was mentioning sort of on background before we started the official recording that I tend to record and I, I don't really release my show in seasons, but I tend to record that way. So I, I record like five or six or seven interviews, you know, all within a couple in a month. And then I work on them and release them once a month over the next like six, seven months. That's kind of how I just do the show. So I don't know what the release order is. Uh, so I don't know if this interview will have come out before or after this, but I was talking to another guest and one of the things that I hit on is that, you know, when they're marketing conventions, uh, I mentioned I'm going on the Star Trek cruise, which is kind of a similar thing. They really only have to sell it one time. They they sell one convention ticket, which is that first one. And then people are like, oh yeah, this is going to be one and done. I got to go to this thing this one time in my life. It's going to be great. And they're like, I have to come every year, like from now on. Like <laughs> I die. And and all of a sudden they're coming back. You know, like I have heard that story so many times on Trek Profiles. So just be yeah. aware, you know, it's like uh I don't know what kind of addiction it is, but I think it also has, yeah. and I'm drawing a connection here. I think it also has a connection to that emptiness that you felt when TOS was over uh, for you watching it in 2022, because that's something that the fans felt in 1969 when Star Trek went yeah. off the air. The show was dead. There was nothing. And this was in the days before Internet, you know, before all the social medias, before all that stuff. And so people got really um, excited about the opportunity to meet with other fans and, and conventions began as a, as a Star Trek thing for other fans to just connect with other people and talk about this thing they loved so much. And there were no movies, you know, the show, the, the network wasn't behind it, um, but it was literally fans organizing these events and selling out and selling all these tickets and selling more tickets than they could possibly fulfill. And, you know, there's stories you can go read about all that stuff, but that's really the origin of conventions is people having that same feeling that that you had i think in a lot of ways and and looking for some mm -hmm. way to to sort of scratch that itch and that's where they came from so i would encourage you you know if, if you're ever if you ever have the right uh, time off and there's a convention near you or you want to come to the big yeah. vegas every year do it you will not regret it yeah and i i that makes perfect sense as well because here i was with a streaming platform with literally everything at my fingertips and i'm feeling forlorn and kind of bittersweet about it yeah well 50 years ago uh, i'd be <laughs> waiting around uh watching probably tape and tv shows as they came on the air because the motion picture didn't come out until what 10 10 years later no longer than that 79 right? yeah okay yeah so 10 years later yeah all right fantastic well the m5 says we should start talking about some episodes are you game i am game all right 
then let's start by talking about TOS Season 2, Episode 3, The Changeling. This, of course, is the one with Nomad and Jackson Roykirk, the creator, uh, and uh, just this the, the robot that's hanging from the wire that you can sort of barely see in the old version, which you can't see in the remastered. And, of course, uh, Nomad, its whole thing is purifying, and he almost takes out uh, that directive on the Enterprise. And we have to deal with an insane computer, which is sort of a thing that happens quite again and again, uh, quite repeatedly in Star Trek. So tell me, what about this particular episode spoke to you? Um, why was it something that you felt so strongly about that you wanted to talk about it on the show? This is one of my favorite, maybe my favorite uh, episode of TOS. And I don't want to be redundant, but a lot of what made this episode special to me is what also made the other episodes that I chose uh, really resonate with me. It's an episode that distinguishes human flaws as something special or compartmentalizes human emotion in a different way than maybe I see it in my day-to-day -day life. Um, I'm going to jump around a little bit here real quick, but in, I believe it's Star Trek VI, Spock has a line where he says, and I'm sure you will be able to correct me if I'm wrong here, he says, and he says, logic is not the end of understanding, it's just the beginning. Logic is not the end of wisdom, it is the beginning. Yes, he says that to Valeris in Star Trek VI. Mm -hmm. Correct. And I think that as a person, I mean, I'm just speaking personally, I have always, long before Star Trek, there's an emotional response to things, there's a rational response to things. In an episode like The Changeling, it allows you to really blend the two and not see your, your emotions or your compassion as something that holds you back. And obviously Nomad is a very extreme character or an example of, yeah, must be sterilized, biological contamination. And you're correct. We see a lot of computers going mad, uh, the M5 included. And just like he always does, Kirk does his, <laughs> I don't even know how to describe it, his little uh, wordplay with them at the end to get them to, to self-destruct. But in that episode, when Nomad doesn't understand Uhura's singing, why? It serves no purpose. It's things like that, that it's such a small example, but it's what makes TOS more timeless. It's what makes it more resonating today. It's about the realities of being human, that we are not, we are not machines. We have emotions. We have we have all these different feelings that aren't necessarily separated from what we'd consider like what's logical, what's rational. And now I'm going to jump again. There's an episode of the TNG where no one has gone before. And the traveler in that episode, and I'm sorry, I didn't even put this in our notes because I'm thinking about it now. The traveler in that episode talks about where humanity is and they don't realize that space and time and thought are all interconnected. And that to me, I was like, Wow, that really resonated with me, whether it's true or not. Um, but it really makes you examine your your feelings, your flaws in a way that I don't know if elevates them is the right word, but really separates them and can make you say, I'm I'm human, but I'm I'm proud to be human. I think this episode does a really good job of painting Nomad as this unfeeling machine. It's going to exterminate biological life and things that serve no purpose. Singing, as an example, with Uhura, you know, they have no place in this world because everything has to be perfect because there are no errors. And this episode really pivots and it's like, hey, to, to be an error is to be human, to make mistakes, to feel these things that maybe we're not proud of. That is in itself just as valid because it's what makes us human. It's actually what defines us. It's what separates us from something like Nomad. And so a lot of the episodes I've chosen today are things that reiterate that same concept. It examines the human condition in a way using the universe to really ask the question, why? Why are we here? It's something that everyone has asked themselves, I imagine. Maybe some people don't. Why are we here? What is the purpose? And Star Trek kind of gives us the ability to examine that on a on a macro level and i've really always enjoyed that 
that sort of explanation of, you know, we are the universe experiencing itself via consciousness. The things that make us are the same elements that were formed in stars, blasted out in supernovas billions of years ago. And I've always found that an extremely comforting thought because it sort of gives an answer to why are humans the way we are? Why are why do we have these feelings that we can't explain? Why do we have emotions that embarrass us, shame us, guilt us? What about compassion? What about generosity? These are all fundamental forces of the universe in a way that maybe we don't quite understand. And that's why I bring up that TNG episode. Maybe space, time, and thought are all more connected. And that is what makes us special. And Nomad is the antithesis of that. And so it kind of plays off that story. And I understand that was an extremely wordy, not really well thought out, <laughs> not really well put answer. It's okay. But that would be my description of why the Changeling re resonates so much with me. It's an episode I actually still think about. And I just, I thought it was just fantastic from start to finish. There's a couple things I thought were a little weird in it. So I shouldn't say that. The whole, when they erase Uhura's mind, th this didn't really sit right with me when it's like, oh, we erased her mind, but she can still speak Swahili, but like, no, learn English. Come on. I was like, ah, that doesn't really sit right with me. That was a little strange. And then also, I guess they rehabilitated her from literally a blank mind into next week's episode. And hey, she's at the controls again. She's at the helm. So that's, uh, that is some school. That got. The wonders of technology. Yeah, yeah. Th this episode is also extremely similar to the motion picture. And so it's no surprise I really enjoyed that as well. Um, I was actually torn between the motion picture and the changeling because I enjoyed both of them so much. It really is pretty much the same story. Also with, you know, Nomad searching for the touch of its creator uh, or V'ger searching for the touch of its creator and then Nomad thinking that Kirk is its creator. And I think it examined a very interesting relationship of, again, our place in the universe. I've read books where, you know, man is referred to as the, the creature that accidentally became God. And who knows, in a thousand years, what human society is going to be like. And I just, I found that very interesting that not only did we create this intelligence, granted it touched an alien probe and then got its mission, but to position humanity in a way that there is intelligence that can be created and intelligence that we also might not understand in a level that we would today. Like when Spock did the mind meld with Nomad, I got to be honest, John, I did not expect it to work. But I thought it was really cool when all of a sudden he did. And it was like, I don't know why that was really impactful to me. It was, oh, well, you know, the mind melt's not going to work because he's doesn't have a brain or anything like that. Okay, well, maybe I'm small minded. Maybe I don't think about intelligence the same way that we will X number of years into the future. And, and so it just I think this episode raised a lot of really interesting questions. and. Yeah, as soon as I finished it, I was like, yeah, that was a banger. That was probably my favorite one yet. Um, so I just tremendously enjoyed this episode. And it was uh, it was a joy to, to rewatch. Again, ending with Kirk's little word salad uh, logic thing against the, the, the machines, which, again, that's kind of, that's what Kirk's there to do. So I, I knew it was going to end that way. I'd seen enough episodes where that happens. So I I'd kind of figured that was a foregone conclusion, but it was still satisfying to see Nomad get confused and, you know, blow himself up. You made a reference to Star Trek Three earlier, which is a film that I also love, and the motion picture as well, which I've defended here on the podcast many times. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting when you go back and you look at some of the symmetries that you see in some of these episodes. So as an example, you made reference to how many times does Kirk talk a computer out of blowing everybody up? And yet, when you go to Star Trek Three, how does the Enterprise end? Kirk talks the computer into blowing up the ship. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's a bookend, right, that, that sort of is the mirror universe of everything that has come before, right? No, 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 yeah. don't, don't do it. Don't, don't destroy us. Don't destroy us, right? Now we're at the end. Computer, please destroy the ship, right? And that, that's how mm -hmm. everything ends. It's, uh, it's really a symmetry that, I, uh, only really, uh, that only really occurred to me as we were talking about it. But um, 
a, a little bit of trivia for you that I happened to discover in my in my notes for this and in my research for this. Uh, and I don't normally do trivia, but I just thought this one was really cool. The picture of Jackson Roy Kirk is actually the director, Mark Daniels, uh, which I just thought was really cool that he put himself in the episode. So just want to put that out there. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about a very different episode, uh, a very different episode. Let's talk about TOS Season 2, Episode 17, A Piece of the Action, with Anthony Caruso as Bella Oxmix. And, of course, we have Vic Tabak as Cracko, who will always be Mel the Cook to me. That's a reference. If you know, you know. And, of course, one of the only episodes in Star Trek that ends with a freeze frame. Very strange. So here, of course, we have the entire planet of the Ioceans, where they base their entire civilization on a book that was left behind by an earlier explorer vessel, all about modeled after Chicago mobs of the 20s. So what in this episode spoke to you, Mark? Why, why is it on the list? The reason I picked this on the list is it shows the versatility of Star Trek as well. I honestly thought this episode was hilarious. I was busting a gut several times watching this episode. It examines the prime directive in a pretty hilarious way of, oh, you know, the contamination. Do we or don't we? They're an imitative species. I mean, as far as deep messages or things like that, I put this on the list because Shatner's overacting is just, uh, he's a riot, especially when he's with the kid and they're doing that exchange. Well, from the mouths of babes, who are you calling a babe? I'm calling you a babe. I'm call well, calm down. It's nothing personal. The way that he <laughs> delivers that, it was a fun, fun episode. Spock being consistently confused by the colloquialisms of these, these gangsters on the planet and the way he just played it, you know, he's the straight man there. And it was so comical and it caught me so off guard because it's it's a pretty bizarre episode. And yeah, the freeze frame, like you said, then it's a piece of the action and everyone's just hamming it up so much. And it just it really felt like a different show that was transplanted into Star Trek. And I'll be damned, but it worked. I mean, it really worked for me. I thought it was hilarious. The one thing that I really questioned was the Spock and McCoy's logical plan to beam back down to Oxmix, where he says, yeah, come back. And, you know, Kirk's tied up and then they immediately get captured again. That was one thing I rewatched in preparation uh, for, for coming on the podcast. I was like, I still don't understand Spock's logic. It's it's usually pretty sound, but it just it it was completely broken for this episode. Just because, all right, well, we need them captured again so that Kirk can bust in, you know, with a Tommy gun or whatever and start hamming it up with his accent. So there are some episodes that are pretty out there oh, yeah. with Star Trek, especially when you realize, like, this was not something I expected when I started TOS. I was expecting some, like, hard sci-fi, to be honest. And all of a sudden, when I'm going back to TOS and it's like... I was amazed at how much, quote unquote, Earth history was all of a sudden in the universe. I was always confused why Spock knew so much about Abraham Lincoln when he shows up in a later episode. And then we have the Nazi planet. And, you know, I kind of would roll my eyes every time, you know, it's like, oh, it, it's like a version of Earth. And I'm like, well, what the, okay, how does Shakespeare and all these Earth-like things? Um, but this was an example of that where it was such a silly premise and, I don't know this, but I have to imagine a lot of the reasons that we have all of these Earth parallels was it, it's a TV show. You have sets. You have to reuse different props and things like that, costumes, because there's so many things. I'm like, this looks like it's from another TV show. I almost put the episode where they um, the shoot out the OK Corral kind of for a similar yeah. reason. Spectre of the Gun. Spectre of the Gun. That's right. Spectre of the Gun. Thank you. But this was, I think, one of the most out there episodes that – Again, it just made me bust a gut laughing. I just thought the overacting was great. The concept was hilarious. Spock's logic absolutely sucked. And it was really just Shatner. The accent just keeps getting thicker, and you don't think he can lay it on anymore. And then you check, and you got 20 minutes left of the episode, and you just better buckle up and hang on. Let's turn to a very serious episode. Let's talk about TOS Season 1, Episode 23. This is a... a a favorite of mine. I don't think it's come up on the show before, though. I'd have to check my notes on that. And that's A Taste of Armageddon. This, of course, is the one where we have the planet where they're basically in a giant video game war battle and executing each other uh, by stepping into execution chambers. It's really 
a bizarre episode when you think about it. And it, it, of course, is a commentary on nuclear war, mutually assured destruction, all of that. And of course, it was filmed and put on TV at a time where that was actually a thing. But I want to know how this episode landed with you in 2022 and why it was special to you. Yes, I really, really enjoyed this episode. Okay, so I mentioned things, you know, regarding the changeling and nomad. And I think that the fusion and also the separation or really analyzing fusion and separation of human and technology is always a very interesting concept. And I just love the idea of this ongoing 500 year quote unquote civilized war. The end result of war is death, but death is not war, if that makes sense. Fundamentally, what they're saying is, well, the computer says that we got disintegrated all per the simulation. So now we must die. And of course, Kirk uses that to turn around. He actually uses those human emotions of fear, of pain, of to, to turn this around and actually threaten them with real war. I think it's uh, General Order 24. And then he, like you said, it's also commentary on nuclear arms races, the, the threat of deterrence uh, and, and continual escalations. Well, we don't want it to get beyond this, so we're going to do what the computer says. And Kirk is really the one with the biggest gun in the room, which is the Enterprise. So then when he destroys the disintegrator, it, it wrecks the whole society in a way um, where they can't quite reconcile. And so it comes back to, we have this civilized war, but we fall back to human emotions as both the cause of the predicament of why we're here, because we're trying to elevate ourselves and be more civilized. And that's why we have a computer that fights the war for us. And those human feelings and emotions are also what ultimately ends it. Those feelings of fear, those threats of escalation from Kirk. And he even mentions... You know, sometimes a hunch is all we have to go on. And it is, is, again, Kirk using his humanness, his humanity, his feelings as wielding power in this situation that is so automated and technologically advanced, all undone with the, the human wrench thrown in the machine. And I just love those type of stories. It's why I love the changeling uh, with Nomad as well for that same sort of um, sort of story beat. There were several other things I really liked about that episode. Uh, I love the cityscape of the planet. I think uh, a mini R7. I, I, I mini R7 and Vendicar. Yep. Those are the two planets. Yes. Thank you. I can't believe I remembered that. It was really great. <laughs> Look at you. And uh, it was really great actually rewatching this episode because I only knew as much as, as the crew when I first watched it, but then rewatching it, knowing what's actually happening and seeing Spock and Kirk deduce the war, scanning for radiation, asking for the types of weapons. Cause I was so confused. So it was just a real treat kind of knowing the, the truth behind it all. And it made the first 20 minutes or so much, much more engaging uh, and, and fun kind of knowing the, the trick uh, behind the curtain. Now, I also like that this civilized system of war, again, it only perpetuates continual war because, as Kirk says, no other nation can sustain 500 years of war. So again, we're examining, okay, are we giving up our, our humanity, the things that make us human, what we consider weakness, at a greater at a greater loss over time to actually have 500 years of genocide against two civilizations. A couple lines that I really, really liked about this episode. Spock, when he is speaking to the Eminarians, and he says, I do not approve, I understand. Really like that line. When he, the logic kind of clicks for him, he's like, okay, I, I see where you're coming from, but uh, yeah, this was not going to be a, a, a long-term solution, obviously. I did enjoy uh, Spock doing the mind meld through the wall. Very, very impressive. I also, something that I found really unique about Star Trek, not really knowing a lot going into it, is how important the chain of command is in the universe of Star Trek. And I like that it is almost always respected and disciplined. And so this is a great episode that examines that because the chain of command comes into contention between Mr. Fox and Scotty running the Enterprise Scotty values the safety and lives of the crew. So again, it's going to be, it's not man versus machine, maybe man versus technology or 
it's Scotty valuing the safety and the lives and the compassion of the crew that saves them. Whereas Mr. Fox, it's relations, it's expanding Starfleet. So anytime that we can pit, you know, a positive human emotion against, you know, an overwhelming bureaucratic force or technological force, those are the episodes I really enjoy. There, I really liked it when Scotty says the haggis is in the fire for sure. That got a good laugh out of me. And then again, Kirk using the rules of escalation threatens more war to stop the war. General Order 24, the Enterprise will attack the planet. And then Kirk has this great line. I didn't start it, Counselor, but I'm liable to finish it. Really, really like that line. Let, let, let's talk about General Order 24 for a second. Um, mm -hmm. It's one of the things in my prep for this and my rewatch that I seized up on. And things like this happen for me from time to time. When in TNG especially, and in Voyager they do some of this, and, and you'll get there and see examples of this. They often talk about, and Deep Space Nine too, they, they often talk about how wonderful the Federation is and, and they make it seem like this utopian paradise. But there are some hints in the show, and I'm talking in the four corners of the screen in the actual episodes, that, that things are far darker at times. And I wonder, what can we say about Starfleet that they would have a General Order 24 for planetary extinction? Like, what's 1 through 23? <laughs> that's, that's the kind of stuff I wonder about. And it's like a clue that there's something really strange that, that they would have such a thing as this yeah. for such an enlightened society. And it's, I don't have an answer here, and I'm not trying to make too much out of it, but it's a clue that, that something is just not right. And I oftentimes run across this sort of utopian Star Trek idea, especially among fans, where they talk about how wonderful the Federation is and how glorious it is and all this. And I think, eh, I don't know. So this was one of those when I said, oh, yeah. dear, I don't know. I don't know about this. <laughs> you know, on that same token, I mean, one of the, the great things is, you know, you have this somewhat utopian view of the future but like you said there's there's these dark corners let me put it this way i am 10 episodes into tng i think i've heard the word or the phrase rape gang like three or four times and it is three or four more times than i expected to hear that in an episode of star trek when tasha yar is talking about her home planet a and federation that, world by the way a federation yes world. Yes. And so then I'm working backwards and I'm trying to think, you know, it's then you're thinking about the prime directive and like, uh, did they not intervene? I, yeah, I completely agree uh, that there are some some dark spots that, um, again, it, it I agree with exactly what you're saying. It makes me curious to know how the Federation came to be now, whether that is continued in Star Trek. Uh, it sounds like you kind of hinted that uh, Enterprise is going to be pre-Federation. But uh, so I'm very interested to see how we got from, yeah, planetary extinction and uh, and we have rape gangs on our planet to, hey, now we're in a piece of the action and we're all, you know, laughing and having freeze frames. Yeah, the um, it's quite it's quite a shift. That, that is another example, right, of like where, you know, there's some things in the Federation which aren't quite right. Um, but there's, there's not too many. And I will say that in in later Trek, I think, especially in the Picard show in season one. You get to see, and this is not a spoiler really, but there's just a lot of stuff that's in the Federation that's not in Starfleet. You're sort of outside of Starfleet seeing some other parts of the Federation, uh, which is actually very rare in all of Star Trek. So you have some interesting uh, some interesting roads ahead of you as, as far as that goes. Absolutely. And last thing I'll say about this episode before we move on, just kind of reiterate my, my thoughts here and I have some notes in front of me. Sure. Again, it's just episodes that that turn on the value of human life i think that episodes that speak about the value of human life i think today it's so easy for any one of us to become desensitized we have computers in our pockets blasting us with bad news all the time outrage and, and things like that and this was like a very chilling example of a society that has actually become desensitized to war. Despite being in a 500 year war, they're completely desensitized to the sickness, horror, disease of war. They, they don't truly know war. They don't truly know fear. And they're so quick to discard human life in the pursuit of keeping the civilized war going because they've never known anything else that 
because of that desensitization, they can't truly fight for peace until Kirk shows up with the big gun and shows them the the really ugly truth or a true threat of what that looks like. So that was that was what I really enjoyed. I, I thought this was just a fantastic episode. So I don't know how much I'm going to get into this, but uh, I'm a veteran and I've got a bunch of friends who are veterans. And one of the things we do in our little group is we pass around some of the combat footage that's coming out um, out of the Ukraine war. And you can see things which were only ever talked about in hushed whispers a long time ago about how war is actually conducted these days. And you're actually seeing the, the depravity of man uh, brought to you, you know, live and streaming, right? And and you can mm-hmm. see these things. And it's it's horrific. A lot of it is horrific. And whatever side you're on, on these kinds of things, you know, you can look at these videos and you see what's happening to these soldiers. And there are some people who cheerlead it. And I find that a, a most distasteful thing, regardless of what side you're on. But when I look at these things, I acknowledge them as necessary, not wonderful things, not yay, go get them, you know, or hooray for us or, you know, bad for them. But I acknowledge it as necessary in achieving the objective. And I'm quite sanguine about this stuff, Um, which surprises some people, uh, especially like when you go into Reddit, for instance, and some of the forums where this stuff is and people will say, wow, that was a great one. Or they make a joke about it. Right. And I will never do those. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because I just see it, I, I do acknowledge it, and I understand a little bit about the technology involved and what they're doing and, and why these things happen and a little bit about combat maneuver, just a very little bit. Um, but I, I acknowledge it as necessary. And when you see an episode like this, they've taken all of that out. And so Kirk's speech hits very differently for me today than it did even two years ago, I would have to say. So that's all I think yeah. I want to say about that. Yeah, very, very well said. Yeah, absolutely. Let's move on and let's talk about something a little bit different. Let's talk about probably one of the most psycho episodes of Star Trek. Animated series, season one, episode eight, <laughs> The Magics of Megas 2. So if yes, I was to describe... Enterprise... Yes, go, <laughs> Sorry, ahead. go ahead. No, no, go do it. Go, go ahead. Do it. Yes, the Enterprise meets Satan. Yes, this was a great episode. <laughs> So I'm just going to imagine trying to explain this episode to someone who's never seen Star Trek before. And I said, so there was a version of Star Trek that was a 1970s kids show, which was on Saturday morning cartoons. And the Enterprise, which is a spaceship, goes to the center of the galaxy and there it discovers Satan. And Satan, uh, and the Enterprise, gets put on trial. And uh, they're basically in the Salem witch trials. And uh, the, the head guy over there is is dressed in like a pilgrim costume. And, you know, just like trying to describe just what happens in the episode is is almost an exercise in futility. And it's only like 22 minutes of TV. And it's insane. It's just insane that such an episode was made. It's insane that they actually got it on the air. The whole thing just, the, the mind boggles. It, it really does. Uh, and so I have to ask you why in the world you picked this episode, which I do think it has its charms, and I'm hoping you'll hit on those. So let, let's go ahead and get into it. So tell me what's going on with the magics of Mega Stu. All right. Um, This episode is absolutely insane. How could I not pick it, John, I think is the the real answer here. (laughs) First of all, you know that I like working out, and I got to say, Lucifer's pecs in this episode are just, they're what I dream of. They're what I hope to become one day. You you know that's going to be the pull quote for this episode right at the front, right? Lucifer's Lucifer's pecs are what I dream of. Like, that's going to be right up front. (laughs) Perfect. Well, now I'm thinking we should have started with this one because now, now I'm really feeling the groove now. I'm, uh, I'm thinking about uh, Jack Lucifer here. So this episode, you know, any time that we can fuse science and magic or really um, admit more what we don't know than what we do is very exciting for me. I don't necessarily want to live in a, in a world where uh, we know the answers to everything. And I don't think we ever quite will. And I think that's what I thought was so interesting about this episode. First of all, we have the Enterprise going to the Galaxy Center. Now, I'd watched Star Trek IV before this, so I was a little confused. Um, but again, canonicity aside, or however this really worked out, we had, why does God need a spaceship in the middle of the universe? And now we have Satan. <laughs> uh, you know, maybe two sides of the same coin. So... 
this episode actually does a couple things that I noticed were common threads in Star Trek. Concepts of human history being shaped by powerful beings. There's uh, who, mo who mourns for a Adonis, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Requiem for Methuselah. Uh, a, a, that's a, a being obviously went through many lifetimes. There's another animated series with like a, one of the Native American gods in it. And I should have written that down. That's yeah, Kukulkan. and so yeah. Kukul Khan, thank you, thank you. And so this was just another one of those episodes, and I I enjoyed all of those as well. Um, but this one just took it to bad insane territory. Pardon my French. And and let me also just say, Spock drawing a pentagram, that image in the ground, that was metal as as well. So I like that. That was a big win for me. Um, <laughs> I do have other questions about this episode. <laughs> I, I rewatched it and I'm wondering what Sulu's end goal was. It really made me uncomfortable when he summons a woman and Lucian shows up and he, the, the enterprise crew all learn magic and he summons this woman and he moves towards her. I'm not sure what was going to happen. He had a weird look in his eye and then thank God the devil showed up to uh, prevent whatever uh, Sulu had in mind to this weird magical woman. I don't know. That didn't sit right with me. There's uh, um, that, That's not the first time that something like that has happened in Star Trek. If you, if you want to go back to TOS and put on the Gamesters of Triskelion, mm -hmm. there's a very strong suggestion that Uhura was raped in the episode. Yes. Oh, I, yes, I saw that the first time I watched it as well. And it just kind of cuts to commercial. I found that extremely uh, disturbing. It's disturbing, yes. Yes, 100%. Yeah, absolutely. I noticed that the, the first time. I kind of don't want to rewatch it for that reason. Other notes on, on this episode that I, I enjoyed or, or found profound. I mean, we get to view human flaws from all the way from Salem to the distant future. Again, I'm a sucker for examining the human condition. I think I've probably made that clear, so I won't try to iterate on that too much more. I did find it really interesting that the prime directive was general order one. And then it got me thinking, okay, if 24 is explode a planet, I just, I'm curious to know what the, the other 22 in between them are. Uh, I don't know if I will find out. I'm sure there's a couple I've missed. And the, the moral of this, you know, Kirk has a great line. We're not interested in legend. He's a living being, an intelligent life form. And of course there's a Kirk magic battle. So that's going to, mm -hmm sit nicely with me as well and so as usual kirk wins with thoughts words he wins with compassion even against you know our own prejudices or stereotypes against we see this horned figure again with massive pecs he's got goat legs he's got horns and admits yes i am what you know as satan and that's not enough for kirk to immediately condemn i i, I love those stories of compassion and I'm sorry to kind of bring this up with something you'd mentioned before, but with, you know, screens and outrage on social media, we talked about becoming desensitized. I, I, I always try to be super conscientious that I am never somebody who would dehumanize another being or person or persons. And I think this episode and the last one actually does a great job of demonstrating that, you know, you see, you can see horrible things on social media, thoughtless comments, jokes about serious situations. and you know, I'm somebody who doesn't want to be that that type of person. And in a strange way, this episode of, of Kirk becoming friends with the devil, of showing that his preconceptions, not taking things at face value and, and really putting thought and, and care into his actions and words ultimately is what saves the day. But again, so does a magic battle. So this episode's kind of got it all. It's got the messages. It's got just some absolutely crazy hijinks. It really caught me off guard the first time I watched it. And uh, yeah, I was glued to the screen. So a little bit of trivia. Uh, I guess I got on a trivia kick because I was getting ready for today's episode. Let's um, do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ed Bishop, who is the actor who voiced Asmodeus, or the prosecutor in the episode, was also mm -hmm. the same actor who was the lunar shuttle pilot in 2001 A Space Odyssey. So I just thought that was just really oh, cool. Oh, no kidding. I just kidding. thought I'd mention that. I yeah, it was really cool. Absolutely love 2001. Me too. Me too. Which is probably why you also like the motion picture. If if you like yes. 2001, you would probably think two that you'd probably think motion picture is pretty doggone good. 
Absolutely. Okay. Let's talk about The Menagerie, Season 1, Episode 11, Star Trek's only two-parter in the original series. And here, of course, we have the one where basically Kirk and Spock watch Star Trek in an episode of Star Trek. So tell me what's going mm -hmm. on with this particular episode and why you felt it was necessary to discuss on today's recording. I really enjoyed this episode. I mentioned earlier, John, that, you know, I watched Wrath of Khan and I think I misspoke earlier. I think I watched Wrath of Khan, then Star Trek three, and then that's when I started with the cage. I'm trying to get my exact order down. So then the cage really threw me because I knew the crew from Strange New Worlds. Even number one was there and, and things like that. So then getting to revisit that in the menagerie, plot points and you know, in universe aside. I really love how limitations can often be springboards for creativity. Now, I did kind of dig a little bit into why this episode was the way that it was. And so I'm aware that, you know, due to rising budgets and, um, and production schedule, they have the pilot that was obviously never going to be aired because it's with a different crew, a different captain. And that's just something that I always enjoy. Um, hey, when you're, you're under the gun, when your back's against the wall, sometimes it can really help you dig deep and come up with really creative ways. And I think this episode was a great example of that. So by having to refit or retrofit an episode and then tell another tale on top of it to make sense and explain the discrepancies. And then on top of that, having seen strange new worlds, that is the perfect melding of, of why I actually loved it. I don't know how I would have felt if I watched this without having seen Strange New Worlds, but seeing what Spock and Pike go through over the course of 10 episodes, and that was kind of my introduction to the universe, I just loved how Spock and Pike in this episode, Spock is so quick to risk everything for Pike. If I hadn't seen Strange New Worlds, I probably would have wondered why, you know? How long do they serve together? I don't really know a lot about their relationship, but seeing it after the most recent series, you know, it was just like, oh, I get it. I, I totally understand the bond that these two guys have, even though they really didn't at the time. And I just thought it played seamlessly into the show and was just a really weird, timeless way to present that uh, in terms of watching it in 2022 with a new show with that crew, reusing a pilot, and then layering another mystery kind of over top. One thing that I was kind of confused about is when Mendez gets replaced, or if he ever was real, because he was created by the Telosians. So I had a hard time even watching it again. I'm like, I'm not sure if he ever was there or when the switch happened. But, um, you know, for what it's worth, it's still a great episode. Uh, for Certainly me. on the shuttlecraft. He, he was never on the shuttlecraft, right? So that's that the point, right? Yeah. Yeah. So then I'm like, well, then where did he go? What happened? How did... Anyway, those are, those are questions for another rewatch. Um, now we can examine the menagerie and say, how does it relate to my experience in Strange New Worlds and the bond between Spock and Pike? I also think that the cage in itself within this episode is a great episode. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. It's fantastic. It's Yeah. So not only are we getting a really creatively drawn storyboard over top, but man, I'm a broken record here. But, you know, you question your existence and you I think a lot of people have that feeling. I certainly have that feeling where you say, hey, do I matter? You know, that's a big question. It actually might not seem like it, but it, it's a big question. And the concept of reality in the cage is really tremendous. And I, I really enjoyed that. If you were given a choice, John, and you could live in this fantasy created by your mind and you wouldn't have to worry about everything ever, you know, would you take it? And absolutely not. Like, because if it's if I know it's not tangible, if there's some doubt in my mind that this is real, then it loses meaning because I think we understand ourselves via our struggles in an imperfect world. And it's a strong part of how we identify ourselves. If you remove that tangible world and you are now in a, a fantasy land, you know, it, it, it runs the risk of a, a, an empty existence, in my opinion. Well, that was my takeaway of watching the original cage. And then obviously they flip it with the menagerie. And now that Pike is on the other side of this accident, 
it provides him salvation in a world where he can no longer operate. Um, now he willingly embraces that, that fantasy, knowing that he can no longer experience his, his previous life, his tangible life. So it was interesting how they kind of flip the messaging, but still speaks to a lot of the same themes. I, again, great episode. And there's a lot to love about this, in my opinion. You know, it's a really old story, too. Um, sometimes people think that, like, The Matrix invented some of this stuff, right? And here's Star Trek doing it. And and if you go back 2,600 years ago, Plato was writing about this with his allegory of the cave, uh, which is basically mm -hmm. the same story but kind of flipped in that if if you had grown up in the Talosian cave and that was all you knew and someone came to you and said, you know, there's a whole great big wide world out there that that is, and this is not it, what you're experiencing. This is all make-believe, phony baloney stuff. Like you would be so outraged by that, you would you would try to kill that person. Like you, or you would think they were crazy, they were insane, right? right. This is Plato writing two thousand six hundred years ago about this stuff. So I think it is something very fundamental to humans to to really have these sort of questions. Like, am I living the life that that matters to me? You know, some some people think about this stuff. I think about this stuff, and 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 it, it, it's it's an important question that I ponder and i think that's a worthwhile question to to have in your head as you go through your day from time to time certainly some people don't certainly some people it's you know eat drink you know go out to the game and whatever and you know have the life that they sure. live and there's nothing wrong with that but i i do think that the kind of people who really dig star trek really think about this stuff from time to time and i and i think that that's a lesson in the show that a lot of fans have taken into themselves and i, I think they're better off for it you know which is uh, one of the most glorious things about Star Trek, in my opinion, is when it breaks out of the screen and really affects people in the real world and, and gives them something to think about, hopefully with the intention of making their life or the world around them a little bit better. Mm -hmm. uh, 100% agree. And that's also why TOS in particular captured me so much. Um, and I love Strange New Worlds. Uh, don't get me wrong. And that's still early in its, uh, you know, its, its show. And there's you know, hopefully going to be a lot more. But yeah, watching the cage right off the bat, I I knew I was in for for something special, and then being able to revisit that same episode within the menagerie, it was just it was glorious. And and like you said, it was these exact themes that you're describing that I think is what what sold me on Star Trek. It's what made it not some old TV show or anything like that. It was hey, I think about this stuff. Hey, I could see myself in this situation and. I could understand the choices and sometimes I can understand both sides of the, the arguments being made. And it's one of those qualities that, that make it timeless where, you know, the planet of Talos four is, is a backdrop, but the question is about human existence and, and philosophy and meaning and, and existence <laughs> and these other big questions, but you know, they're being asked in a, in a fun manner and we get phasers and we can blow up things and, and it, it just all adds up to the total package. So while we're talking about the menagerie and the cage, let's talk about another early Star Trek episode. Let's talk about TOS season one, episode three, where no one has gone before, technically the second pilot. And this is the third episode aired, but actually the first one done. And here, of course, we have Gary Lockwood as Gary Mitchell and Sally Kellerman as Elizabeth dinner where they gain godlike powers certainly something we don't see in star trek very often <laughs> i lie um but i want to know what about this episode brought itself to your attention why is it on the list mark tell me this episode made the list because of the way it examines power versus responsibility and it does that with escalating stakes you know kirk is willing to detonate the entire station to, to stop mitchell anytime that we can examine escalation of, of power corruption, but also, again, holding on to those, those humanistic qualities of responsibility. That's a great Star Trek story for me. Now, I, I have some notes about this episode um, that if it's all right with you, I'll kind of go over because I, I hadn't watched this. I, I watched it so early on. And so now having come full circle, watching everything TOS and then touching back on it, there was a lot more that jumped out on me. First of all, absolutely bizarre seeing Spock in gold um, or a gold uniform, I should say. Even things like I understand that, you know, when they're playing up, oh, he's he's half Vulcan, but he didn't know what irritation was. And that just really got a rise out of me um, because Spock of 
any later episode, he is, he understands what irritation is, or at least the concept that he is totally unfeeling. I, I believe he's called a Vulcanian in these early episodes. Oh, Vulcan. And you know what? I, then that totally went over my head because I was probably furiously writing down all these all these things. Scotty in a gold suit, Sulu in blue, all of that was kind of odd. One thing I really enjoyed was the explanation of Gary's and Kirk's relationship, uh, their past. We get little bits of that. Who is the bully that, that comes back to taunt Kirk in the, the episode where they're on? Finnegan. Finnegan, that's it, yeah. So, um, you know, we get some glimpses about who these characters were before they, they were aboard the Enterprise. And so that was something that I tremendously uh, enjoyed. So now we have Gary, who's enjoying his growing intellect. He's absorbing more and more information. But I also like, again, there's an escalation of power versus responsibility, escalating stakes. But the show does a great job of painting a compelling picture of both Mitchell as a victim and a villain simultaneously in a way that really surprised me. He really, to use a pro wrestling term, because that's, you know, what I know, his heel turn is when he touches Dr. Denner's hair and then smells his fingers in that weird way. And then as soon as he does that, I'm like, all right, he's going full villain. You know, we, we have crossed the line, you know, he is a victim, but, you know, that was like what it signifies to the audience. Okay, this is, this is not going to end well. I actually thought the, the performance by Gary Lockwood was really captivating. Um, so we have several different conflicts in the show. We have the victim and the villain, uh, logic versus heart. When Spock is suggesting to Kirk, we kill Mitchell before he grows further in power and Kirk cannot do it. Uh, Spock is also referring to Dr. Denner and mentions she feels and I don't. Just a very cool quote that I really enjoyed that kind of really got me to, to better understand the Spock character that early on. I do enjoy very much how this growing power is presented as a negative. Obviously not just because Mitchell is the villain of the episode or anything like that, but you know, it erodes that humanity, it erodes that compassion and you know, I can't say this with any amount of certainty, but if we found out today that we can create gods by shooting people through the edge of the galaxy, we'd have an army of them by now. You know, so it it, it was a nice higher level view of the responsibility that comes with that power and shows that that compassion is a strictly human trait because uh, I believe compassion is one of those flaws that Gary points out. You know, the flaws, the worries, things like that that he derides in his more godlike uh, form, it's actually, again, I like to think what makes us special gives us the capacity to move forward as a species and is ultimately how Kirk can, can appeal and, and ultimately win. Love the quote from Gary at the end when he says, morals are for men, not gods. Really, really great line there. Kirk retorts back, a god but still driven by human frailty. And those human frailty and flaws, they are what caused Gary to become evil, yet it is simultaneously his salvation. And what Kirk promotes is what makes us special. Kirk pleading against a human becoming a god, pleading against power. To quote Star Trek II, putting the needs of the many before the needs of the few. And it's his passionate speech. That's what makes Elizabeth turn on Gary and ultimately allow for his defeat. So it's a god that is created and simultaneously undone by that human frailty. I mean, there's just a lot going on in this episode and all that. And I didn't even touch on James R. Kirk on the Tomb Zone. James R. Riberius Kirk, I guess. That threw <laughs> me for a loop on the rewatch. But yeah, this this was a tremendous episode. And it hit really hard early on when I was getting into TOS. And it, it's still, after watching everything coming back to it, it's still absolutely fantastic. James R. Kirk and the Vulcanians is a great band name. Yeah, I just want James to point that out, so. R. Kirk and the Vulcanians and mismatched uniforms and, and no McCoy in this episode either. <laughs> I've talked about this before on Trek Profiles, but I'll just say this once for you, which is I don't believe Star Trek canon actually exists. Um, I don't believe that the authors of the show were terribly interested in having incredibly consistent, detailed world building. Um, I think that's mostly a fan invention. So, I, you know, I think they tried to stick to things that had gone on before, but I don't think they were ever overly concerned about it. So the more that you watch Star Trek, the more you'll say, they'll say things like, well, this is a rule. 
and then three episodes later, it's not a rule. It's not a thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you'll, you'll see lots of that. And so I would just advise you to not get hung up on that stuff or to try to reconcile <laughs> these things. Because uh, they'll sure. just say, oh, you sure. know, we, we, we got a new upgrade to the sensors. Now we can do that thing. Or, you know, oh, well, that, you know, this is an absolute rule of the universe. Next episode, like they disregard it completely. So, you know, if that stuff is going to bug you, you're, you're going to have a hard time in a lot of Star Trek. <laughs> yes. Yes. I think it's it's usually best at the, you know, at the cost of continuity or anything like that. Hey, tell me a good story. And that's going to matter more than anything else. Uh, this episode doesn't resonate because of the the uniform colors and the R on the tombstone. But, uh, you know, there's there's a lot to this story. But, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, it was the first time that I was like, hey, there's a lot that doesn't add up here. But I think you are 100 percent correct, John. And hey, look, we have another episode with a 2001 reference that we're talking about uh, in the same episode of Trek Profiles. So that's fantastic. There you go. <laughs> Gary Lockwood, of course, was uh, Frank Poole, I believe, in 2001. Mm-hmm. So there you go. Mm-hmm. Mark, we talked about a lot of episodes. You you made your confessional post. You're spending a couple of hours talking to some rando who, who blind messaged you off of the internet saying, I want to talk about Star Trek. I have to come to the conclusion that Star Trek has become something that's important to you. And my question is, why? What does Star Trek mean to you? That's a very powerful question as far as why it's important and and why it endures. And it sounds so empty for me to say that. You know, I started watching it last year. So there was a fundamental feeling that I got when Star Trek finally clicked for me. I didn't get it when I watched Star Trek Wrath of Khan as great as that movie was. Uh, I didn't yet get it when I watched Star Trek three. I don't know exactly when it happened, but there was a period when I'm watching TOS. And again, I don't even know when the moment happened, but it was when I, it clicked. I understood Star Trek. I understood why people loved it. I think my preconception before diving in, before the, mediocre halo show sent me on this uh free fall into star trek and we'll always be grateful to it for that despite anything else uh, we could say about that tv show it is much more than a science fiction universe that you can get lost in all of these stories they are stories about the human condition they are stories about people they are stories about compassion and they are stories about what we could potentially become And I think that is what always drove me to continue to think about the next episode. Now, I am not here to start any fandom wars or anything like that, but I watched a lot of Star Wars growing up. And, you know, you always hear the comparison and they're nothing alike. Now, having like really gotten into Star Trek, you know, Star Wars is a a great fantasy in space and it's exciting and and there's good guys and bad guys, but I don't spend time thinking about the morals of Star Wars. Jedi and Sith, I know who's good, I know who's bad. You know, there there are some gray areas. Star Trek is built on those questions, though, and sometimes it doesn't always provide you the answer. It does a really great job of presenting ideas that are as relevant as they were in 1960s, to, rele- to being relevant today, to being relevant allegedly thousands of years in the future, and does so with an interesting backdrop and great characters that are relatable, that are human, that have compassion, and often challenges our own preconceptions or, or ideas of what might be right or wrong. Um, in just a couple of the episodes we talked about today, John, A Taste of Armageddon, looking at, okay, let's actually zoom out and remove the the horror from war and what are we left with? It helps viewers understand and expose ideas that already exist today without all the trappings uh, and distractions that we might put around them, questions that we might ask, ask ourselves, things that we see going on today in the world. And it does so in a fantastical setting. These are the reasons that I really enjoy Star Trek because many episodes leave me with Questions that I can ponder on my own time or connections or parallels I can draw. This is, you know, maybe a a shallow example, but qualities of leadership in Star Trek are really well demonstrated in my opinion. And I think that for anybody who 
let's just say, you know, works in an organization or wants to hold themselves as a, a leader among others um, can learn from the qualities that that make a great starship captain that, you know, could also make a great sales leader in a sales organization or something like that. Um, so I just find the ability to connect with Star Trek is what sets it apart. And that was the feeling I got when I said, OK, I get it now. I, I get why there's. 41 TV shows and 97 movies and things like this, because I was completely blind to that fact before. And, and once that feeling clicked and I really understood what I believe to be the, the heart of Star Trek, or at least the heart of the original series through my interpretation, um, it was something really special. And I haven't really seen anything like it before. So that's my my very long answer to a, a simple question, I suppose. No worries, Mark. I, a lot of the answers to that question are like that. <laughs> but I have to tell you that I've enjoyed our conversation, but the M5 is communicating with me and telling me that it is now time for the Kobayashi Maru. All right. The Kobayashi Maru is a challenging and difficult test, cunningly prepared by the M5, just for you. Should you not only survive the test, but pass it as well, the M5 will award you an honorary Star Trek title on behalf of our little program. Are you ready to face the Kobayashi Maru? Mark, I ask you. I am ready, John. M5, load the Kobayashi Maru simulation and prepare to record Mark's responses. Kobayashi Maru available and ready. Question one, who's chasing you, V'ger or Nomad? Nomad. Question two, we are on the TOS 1701 and our shift is over. What are we going to do? Go singing with Uhura or go fencing with Sulu? Singing with Uhura. Question three, which of these robots would be your preferred companion? The ILEA Probe, Ruck, or the A500 Model F5 Synth? ILEA Probe. Question four, which planet should we revisit? Delta Vega, M113, or Triacus? M113. And finally, question five, which of these TOS Constitution class vessels is your favorite? The Hood, the Potemkin, the Lexington, or the Excalibur? The Potemkin. Simulation complete. M5, please compute the results and tell us if our guest has passed the Kobayashi Maru. Analyzing performance. So, Mark, I am pleased to tell you that the M5 has calculated that you have passed the Kobayashi Maru simulation. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleased to hear that. And now, the M5, who has analyzed your answers, will award you an honorary Star Trek title on behalf of our little program. M5, what title shall we award our guest? Mark is awarded the title of Holodeck Fitness Program Designer for Starfleet Medical. So there you go. Excellent. Excellent. Cannot wait. Where where do I where and when do I report to and how can I get started? So Mark, please tell people uh, where they can follow you if anywhere, uh, if they want to continue the conversation, do you want to share anything or or tell them where they can uh, pester you for updates on your Star Trek viewing? Absolutely. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm not a, a big social media guy. I don't have a Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I don't really even understand what TikTok is. However, I do have a YouTube channel and it's called 8-Bit Lifts, like the number. I'm a, a self-professed nerd. I am now uh, an honorary Star Trek nerd after this episode. You're not honorary. And There's no honorary. <laughs> You're a legit. There, there, no, 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 no. You are a legit. There is no honorary. Well, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I have a YouTube channel where I mostly post music to listen to in the gym. I will be making a Star Trek mix so you can jam out to soundtracks from the motion pictures uh, while you get a good pump going. Uh, that is really my, my first and foremost passion besides all the nerdy stuff. Um, I, I love lifting, nutrition, fitness, exercise. So I can't wait to get started uh, with my, my new title and work with the medical team and get the Enterprise uh, as swole as possible. Mark, thank you so much for being part of Trek Profiles. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me.
Here ends this installment of the Trek Profiles podcast. And before we offer a quote to close this episode, I'd like to remind you that you may send us your happy little messages of joy, your angry dispatches of disapproval, or samples of your latest Nero Elixis crossover slash fic to feedback at trekprofiles.com or on Facebook or Twitter at Trek Profiles. Anything you send us, maybe using the show, or it may be fed to the attack triple on Daystrom Station. Some portions of the Kobayashi Maru lightning round questions in this very episode were written by listener Adam Sanders. I encourage each and every one of you to send me your ideas for questions, and I thank Adam for his contributions to the show. This time, I'll leave you with a quote from Captain Kirk, who in the episode The Magics of Megas 2 said, quote, Knowledge is freedom. Close quote. Thanks for listening, and live long and prosper. This handcrafted podcast is brought to you by Stars and Sky Media Lab. It's cosmic. So, yeah, I have been doing this occasional series with, like, the newer fans. Yeah. And it's it's been great. It's really been great. Um, the, I, so this is maybe the fifth one I've done. And, okay. And w- what I love about it I got to say is that there's all this stuff that's in the fandom, like for the lifers like me that we're aware Mm -hmm. of. And there's sort of the list of episodes you're supposed to like, and the ones you're supposed to hate and like the people you're supposed to like, and the people you're supposed to hate. And like, there's these certain issues that always come up and like newer fans, they don't have any of that. Uh, You know, unless they've like, yeah, yeah. There's no, there's no baggage. And so you get a very different (laughs) perspective on things. Uh, which I absolutely love and and enjoy. So I'm very much looking forward to this. And I will say that right up front. You're a you're a new fan. So, mm-hmm. all right, okay. And and also you're a fitness guy. I am a fitness guy. Yeah. I, I guess if I if I fit that mold, I would classify myself. Yes. All right. So maybe mm-hmm. uh, for the bonus material, I'll ask you a couple of questions on how to get swole. Let's do it. I, I love talking about that. I will try to keep my answers succinct. No, no. <laughs> it's, why man, I have the, it's why I do the YouTube channel and uh, I'll even make, I'll, I'll obviously put it on hold, but I'm already putting together a Star Trek gym mix so that when you let me know, hey, when and if this is going to release, I'll, uh, I'll drop it to, at the same time. Oh, that, that's glorious. That's glorious. You know, there's a, mm-hmm. there's a Star Trek fitness group called Body by Starfleet. It's, uh, oh, well, I'm writing that down. It's it's up on it's up on the book face if you're on there. So Okay. I am not. I am on no other social media. I am like just kind of a, a hermit in that sense. So So you have not seen the A five hundred model F five synth. Uh that's actually in season one of Picard, so you have that to look forward to. But okay. uh Ruck, if you remember, that was that was the the big tall lurch guy. Down on the and what what are little girls made of? Where Nurse Chapel oh, has a little boyfriend, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could not remember that. Yeah, I did not. Okay, I know exactly who you're talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you got some good stuff to look to look forward to, and the the four Constitution class vessels were the four ships that the M five attacked in the Ultimate Computer. <laughs> yeah, the um, the so the Potemkin that that's in the 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 episode with the M five. Yeah, all four of those were. Yeah, those okay, were the four, four starships. Yeah, because I remember that was a. I I thought it was so weird. I because that that stuck out to me because I remember hearing it and I was like, "Isn't the the Potemkin was like the Russian battleship?" And I just thought it was a weird thing to name a future Federation ship. So that's why it jumped out to me the the first time I saw it, and then that was like that was just my answer there. So. No, it's all good. It's all good. I mean, they, they were very um, cosmopolitan in that way in the original Star Trek, right? I mean, that's the whole reason yeah. you check off on the ship, right? We're going right. to, you know, I mean, remember the Soviets were our enemies, you know, at the time. So, of course, there's yes. going to be a Russian guy, right? So, it was great. Okay. I will say, if I can comment. Um, yeah, go ahead. Dancing with Sulu, that episode where, again, I don't know the episode titles that well, but yeah, when he's shirtless running around stabbing people, there is no way I'm getting anywhere near that under any circumstances. So <laughs> singing with Uhura, I would uh, 
I would probably rather have McCoy shoot me up with whatever because he does that a lot too. <laughs> so, yeah, that I uh, would never mess with Sulu. Yes, yeah, all of his. Oh, do you need a stimulant? Like, what, what, what kind of operation are we running here, McCoy? Well, well, you know, if you're gonna get a shot from McCoy, you at least want to have him rip your shirt open before he gives you the shot, right? Because we see yeah. that a bunch of times in TOS too, which you know, I always yes, love. he does. Yes. So was that okay for you? That was okay. I think uh, just because of the, the time of day, I I felt like I didn't really start like just like getting into it until we started talking about Magics of Megas two. To be honest. Because I have a, so many... Don't sweat it, man. <laughs> yeah, I have like a lot of these big thoughts and I'm looking through my notes and it was like, oh man, I'm like, maybe I didn't have the format and I, I was overthinking probably for the first like 40 minutes. So I was like, okay, just start start feeling it. Uh, so I hope... The, was it okay for you? Oh yeah, no, it was all good. I mean, you know, one of the problems I have in recording this podcast is, I mean, I'm doing every episode, right? So yeah. I've like made some of these observations like 15 times. And so yeah. e even though my show is not episodic, I mean, you can, it's not serialized, excuse me. You can come in and listen to one episode or, you know, five episodes. You can listen to them out of order. It doesn't matter, right? Cause it's not a, mm -hmm. it's not like a fiction podcast where it's in order, right? You can do it any, any order you want. But I'm always like hesitant to say, how much should I say if I've talked about this thing before, right? It's like, I've talked extensively about Star Trek canon. I have talked extensively yeah. about like why Star Trek one is probably the most ambitious Star Trek film that's ever been made. Um, yeah. Like, way, way more than any of the others. Like I have gone on at length <laughs> on yeah. all those things. <laughs> so yeah. I always kind of pull it back. And that's why I'll say things like, ah, I've talked about this before, but you know, here's like a little hint of something <laughs> yeah and yeah, sometimes people was... give me grief about it <laughs> you know it, it it was great now like understanding the the format i wouldn't say that i would have picked different episodes but i might have done like another fun one because i'm realizing now i'm like i really i like a certain type of episode i probably should have diversified a little bit more uh if i'm being honest but hey you're the one who's gonna edit through all this stuff because i'm like well, I like this episode because it's this concept that I like from this episode. And I was like, I, I should have just really gone with more of a shotgun approach. And and like, because I really enjoyed talking about piece of the action of Magic of Megas 2. And I was like, should have done more of that. But you know what? Uh, I'm I'm happy. And I'm just, honestly, I'm honored that you reached out uh, because of that initial Reddit post. And that was very cool to, to have been invited on here. So thank you. One of the things you might do, and this is for all my guests, even the ones who've been watching this stuff for 50 years now, is is you can consider this like a little Star Trek time capsule. Um, mm -hmm. And what you might do is when you've finished all 800 and something hours of Star Trek, is, which is how much there is, there's over 800 hours of Star Trek, canonical Star Trek, right? And then there's the movies. Yeah. And the, I mean, not the movies, but like the, the fanfic and the novels and the comics yeah. and all that stuff is on top of it. Um is you can go back to this and then hear like, this is what you thought about Star Trek at this particular point in time. And you may have very different opinions, which is okay uh, by the time yeah. you get to the end of it, right? Because there'll, there'll be different things that come up in different episodes. And what you'll see, I think, and this, again, this is not a spoiler because you've already seen some of this, is that Star Trek oftentimes likes to do the exact same story over and over again. And yeah. in the different incarnations of Star Trek, you'll see different captains uh, different characters react to a very similar situation with some wildly different points of view, you know? So and like without- I was able to get that with, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Uh, like uh, just one thing I'll say is like, for instance, Q comes back in TNG. He's in TNG where the three came from, but he's also in Deep Space Nine. He's also in Voyager. Yeah. And he's also in the Picard show. And you'll see that like every time he shows up, there's like some very different, reactions to him <laughs> that that was what was so cool about um the finale of strange new worlds and then the original balance of terror where it's like different captain and the same scenario watching it play out with like the romulans and things like that and yeah one leads to intergalactic war and then the other one is is how kirk kind of deftly avoids that and that was really really cool um to to be able to see yeah it's just uh I know I already said all this about like why I love Star Trek, but that was maybe that. Now I wouldn't say that's necessarily the point, but that's when a good example of 
I understand why people like this show. I understand what it is, or at least what I've seen. I understand what that is or what that means to me. Now I'm, I'm a baby and I've gone this far and we got this much to go. So that's going to change a lot. But um, yeah, I'm just, I'm so glad that the Halo show came out <laughs> and got me on this path. I will forever be grateful. <laughs> so I have to ask you, uh, Eight bit lifts. What's eight bit? Is that? I mean, obviously that's a video game reference. Uh, so are we yeah. like lifting to Super Mario Brothers, or what? What are we doing here? What's? Oh yeah. What is that? Oh yes. Yeah. So um, it really it it came down to, I like the like little alliteration within or the little rhyme within eight bit lifts, but uh, it actually stemmed from why I started the channel, and I'll make this very succinct here, but. Uh, I like listen. I would listen to like film scores and things like that. Uh, I would listen to like the Conan the Barbarian. You know, I'm a big fan of Arnold, obviously. And then I started listening to old video game music, but it was always stuff that I, like from my childhood because it just you know it resonates with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'd be listening to all this like old like chip tune stuff from like 8-bit and 16-bit video games. So that was where the name came from. Although I don't just have like old uploads. I usually find like. I scour sites for like fan remixes and electronic and rock and things like that and uh, kind of mash them all together. So that is where the the name came from. So it's a very like sort of retro video game thing because that's that's what I love and that's what I grew up playing. So what, what are you playing these days? Let's see. These days, um, I still play Halo, uh, you know, so I'll regularly do that. In the past, I, I was known to compete in a, a Halo tournament or two. Uh, so. Ooh. Yeah. And then, uh, but beyond that, you know, I'm a big fan of Resident Evil. So nice. I, I will always go back and just play the old Resident Evil games pretty much endlessly. I have my PlayStation one hooked up to my TV right next to the Xbox series X, the latest and greatest. And I still play my old games that way. So yeah, but, uh, otherwise I just try to make gaming social play with my friends and, and family and things like that. So it becomes you know, less about the games and more about, you know, sharing conversation and, and stories and things like that. Well, I want you to follow up and play some Star Trek online. Let me know what you think about that. I'm going to have to, and I'm going to have to make a post about it on my YouTube channel. No, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah. Best, best video game of all time, in your opinion, hot take, give it to me. Resident Evil 2. So the, the original 1998 Resident Evil 2 for PlayStation 1, uh, let me put it this way. That is my favorite game. Is it the best? That, that is too big a question for me to say, my friend. Uh, but that is my favorite and is probably the one that I've played the most in my entire life. How about you? A couple different ones. Um, I'm a, I was an MMO player for a long time. And I, I played the original EverQuest for 11 yes. years. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. And, I'm, and I'm talking, I started playing in 1999, like when the game came out. So yeah. uh, I have a long history with that game and I could go down many a rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. And, and in fact, I was even playing it just a few years ago. I, I started picking it up and playing it again. So uh, yeah, but I, I'm, I'm off of it now. And then I moved on to another MMO. I was playing Eve online, uh, which yeah. I played for a little over a year. And that game is like so hardcore and unforgiving. It's, but it's like, it's, you know what? It's like, it's like actual combat hours and hours mm -hmm. of boredom followed by moments of sheer panic like like yep. like my hands are shaking on the keyboard kind of panic right and it's it's, yeah. it's like that um and it just it was too much of a roller coaster for me um but as far as like solo games uh, my two favorites without a doubt are um skyrim uh yes. which i still play all the time uh i have an elder schools workout mix on my channel so you can listen to nice jim Mm -hmm. Nice, nice, nice. Are you sworn to carry the burdens? I mean, that's, you know, the only thing. <laughs> yes. <yeah. laughs> that's a little in joke. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, and me personally, I uh, I started with Morrowind and Morrowind and Oblivion before Sky, uh, Skyrim. I do love Skyrim, very different, but Morrowind was like one of the first games that I really got lost in. And it's much clunkier by today's standards, but I love, love, love that game. All the Elder Scrolls are great. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I will say this though, is that I, even though I've played the game through, there are some things I just can't bring myself to do in the game. So like, yeah. I will, I will never be on the Stormcloak side because they are straight up <laughs> racist and it's like, yeah. it bugs me so much. It's like, these guys are so racist. I can't. 
you know? And so yeah. even though there's like I've whole done parts of the game, sides. I just can't get into. I yeah, I, I had to do both because I wanted to see what would happen. Uh, I do have an active playthrough going because, of course, I bought the game again on my Switch. And now I'm, <laughs> the, uh, now I'm on the Imperial side because uh, I've alternated a couple times. I have never, ever gone through, and I've played through Skyrim like six times. I always kill Astrid immediately. Yeah, when she appears, like she, I think at one point she knocks you out, you wake up in a cabin, and she like basically mm -hmm. says, Do you want to join? I, I always kill her immediately. And the last thing she says is, Well done. You know, it's like she tells you you made the right call. Oh, uh, because I can, I can never do the Dark Brotherhood stuff. So like I always oh. go there and like wipe them all out. And I know it's a big part of the game and there's all kinds of quests I'm missing out on, but I'm like, Nope, not doing it. You know, so like those two things I can't find myself. I just, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> See, I kind of have fun to like, so me in, in Oblivion, it's Lucy and Lachance who invites you in. So he's like my character, but uh, I always get a kick out of playing like the evil characters just because it's like, well, you know, you, you, you be a good human, you do your good deeds. And then it, it's more curiosity. Well, what would happen if I do this? Are they really, is the game really going to let me do this? Oh my God, is it going to let me kill a kid? Well, I have to find out. Like, I will be that guy where I'm like, I will push the game, make a save. Like, whenever I'm talking to somebody, I'm like, hold on, make a save. <laughs> and then save. you just know that, yep, as soon as I quick save, it's like some bad shit is going to go down. So I will. You got to gotta adopt the kids. You're not supposed to kill them. Yeah, I, uh, I think I have one wife in my latest game, but I don't have any kids. Uh, yeah, I, got, I just finished up, like, the Dawn Guard quest line. That was. I travel a lot for work, so watch Star Trek, play on my Switch, read, and I work out at the hotel gyms, and that'll fill my time. So, my my other game is uh, Alien Isolation, uh, which yeah. is a game that I have profound love for. <laughs> yeah, and scary okay. as hell. <laughs> I have not played that yet. It is on my list. Uh, I'm obviously a big horror fan because I love Resident Evil. Uh, I love Evil Within. I played games like Amnesia and Outlast. Um, I just haven't had time because I play more games socially now and I'm like, um, I'm, I'm engaged to be married and I live with my fiance and stuff. And, you know, you prioritize, I'm not just going to play games all the time, but, um, what I love about the alien movies, I mentioned this earlier, but the aesthetic of star Trek, that retro future, I love what people thought the future was going to look like in the seventies, sixties and eighties. Uh, like that's what I love. Future scenes in Terminator, future scenes in any of the Alien movies, like future scenes in Star Trek, that aesthetic of like thick monitors, I don't know, there's something about it that I just, I'm a huge fan of that aesthetic, and I've seen videos of Alien Isolation, and it has that in spades, so I'm like, well, I just want to play for the, the atmosphere. The original movie Alien still holds up. Oh, yes, you know? it does. It still holds up. I mean, yes. all the effects, the way the ship looks, all that stuff, but... The, the thing about Alien Isolation, right, is that, is that, you know, it's basically a horror thing and there's, you know, the alien and you're trying not to get eaten, right? And the thing is, if you see the alien, you're done. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. You cannot defeat the alien. So yeah. it's, it's almost like the opposite of a lot of shooter games where, like, you're trying to, like, defeat – you are not trying to defeat the alien. You cannot defeat it. Yeah. If he sees you. It's – if Murder McMurder Face sees you, it's over. <laughs> So, so here is – oh, sorry. Go ahead, please. No, uh, th th what I was going to say is one of the things the game is actually known for is the AI system, um, mm -hmm. which is incredibly clever the way they designed it. So there's there's one feature where if the game has access to the microphone and you make noise, that attracts the alien to you. Yeah. So you, you have to play the game and be quiet. Second, the game has two AIs. It has the actual alien AI, which doesn't know where you are, you know, but if it sees you and if it sees you like escape, like through a hatch, it's going to realize, oh, you like to go through the hatch. Now I'm going to start searching all the hatches. So like it learns from what you do if you escape. Yeah. Second, there's a, a game AI that has total knowledge, right? Because obviously it's, it, it's yeah. the game, right? But it gives clues to the alien AI as to where you are because the maps okay. are huge. So, so in re reality, you could hide from the alien, you know, but, yeah. but the game's not going to let you do that. So it's yeah. going to give clues to the alien where you're at. And man, that game is like terrifying. And I died so many times, so many times, you know, and <laughs> if the alien sees you, it's, it's like 
over. You know, the, the number of times you can actually escape from him is very small. <laughs> so I just real quick on that note, one of my, if, if my, my top three, like game series would be like, I like resident evil. I like halo. I like metal gear. And, um, there's a metal gear solid five. It kind of has the same thing where it's like, you're, you're sneaking around, you're infiltrating bases, but if you keep playing the same way, then the game knows. And it's like, okay, you keep using this tactic. Now here's the countermeasure. If you keep, if you get too comfortable, anytime you do that, it, the game will prevent you and force you to adapt on the fly. Oh, you're, you're sniping everybody from hundred meters away. Guess what? Everyone's wearing helmets now and you cannot headshot them, things like that. Um, but Here's here's my thing with Alien Isolation, because I've looked into the game, and like I said, I haven't played it yet. I like horror games, but see, what you're saying is like, you see the alien and you're done, and it's terrifying, which makes sense. I enjoy, like, player agency in games. It's why games like Skyrim and Morrowind and Oblivion are, like, crack, because I'm like, okay, I just want to see what the game's going to let me do. So let me see what I can get away with. And I always like player agency and choice. And I, for me, that's like where tension comes in, where it's like, uh, have you played like a like an old Resident Evil game? I've not played any of them. Okay, okay. So I don't so, have any consoles. I, I okay. only have PC for for gaming. So just accept that. Okay. So like I don't, I, you know. So if it's like a PlayStation game or an Xbox game, I've never played it. Okay. So so Resident Evil is a horror game. And you, you have very limited resources. And the thing that makes it scary for me is like the choice, like there's, it's choice and consequence. And it's like, okay, I have three bullets. I'm low on health. There's an, a monster coming towards me. And for me, I'm like, okay, I can run. That's a choice you can make. Uh, but now the monster's still going to be there. He's going to follow me. He's going to do this. Or I have to, I have to make the choice to spend my three bullets and it might not be enough to take down the monster. And then I'm going to have no bullets and an angry monster, but I have to right. live with that choice. And so like, I'm a huge fan. I've played other horror games where it's like, you kind of run away and things like that, but I'm like, give me a choice and then make me live with it. And that is like true tension and terror. And that like, that's what I, I like to go for. It's like, you're, you're combining your resources, you're mapping out, but you live or die by your choice. You can't blame the game. You can't do this. Like, it's a playground that you have to navigate. And and not saying that iso Alien Isolation isn't like that, but I really enjoy games where I can engage the enemy and like have a small win, at a, but it comes at a cost. That's like what I always love. Every action has a cost to it. Um, the more actions, the more things I can interact with, the more I will like that game. I totally have my brain mapped out. So games that fit that, I will play, and I just absolutely love them. Did, did you ever play Detroit Becoming Human? I don't have a PlayStation, so I, I have not played that. No, no it's, well, it's I, on I Steam. I, I got it on PC. I got it. I got it. Oh, on PC. okay. So yeah. Oh, I didn't um, know that. I thought it was PlayStation exclusive. So that was a game that made me made me so frustrated. I want to punch a hole through the computer. So <laughs> it's basically a choose your own adventure sort of game. Um, and there's yeah. some live action sort of run around kind of elements, but it, it's real. It, but if you like player choice, it has a lot of that. Um, with okay. multiple endings and, and different ways that you can do the game. And yeah. w one of the things, though, is that the choices it gives you are never choices you want to do. So an example is, and this is the, the premise of the game, it's not a spoiler. So you play as three different uh, synthetic characters. You're three different robots or yeah. androids. And you go through the game as each of these robots and you each, you know, you switch from one character to the other at certain points. And at one point you're playing a female domestic uh, robot. And basically, you've been bought by a guy who is a drunk abuser. And yeah. he's got this young daughter, and he's incredibly abusive to her. And then the game freezes, and it says, here's your choice. Clean the kitchen or take out the trash. And you're like, oh, I don't want any of them. Like, I don't want any of these choices. These, none of these are yeah. the correct choice. You know? Yeah. And it's just, it's it's so frustrating. So frustrating. But I'll tell you the thing I'm most excited about. You know, th this is actually something that has been bugging me for years. I always wanted to play The Last of Us. Uh, and <laughs> they're making too, the show. And you and I are in the same boat, and now we're watching it, right? <laughs> no, I'm not watching it because I, oh. I know that it's based oh. on the game. 
So oh. I want to play the game. I don't I don't want to watch the show. I want to play the game because that's that's the OG experience. So yeah. it's just now coming out for PC. Just okay. Now. So in March, it's going to be out on Steam. I've already pre-ordered it. So okay. That, I, I'm very excited for that. Oh, I'm taking the lazy way out. Like I, my computer might be able to run it. I just don't really game on my computer at all. Um, so I just play on, on my console. So I was like, ah, I'll, I'll watch it on, on HBO because then that way I can watch it with my fiance and that's going to be, be playing a game or something like that. Yeah, but you got so a I'm PlayStation. I'm watching the show. No, no, I, I only have an Xbox. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, oh. I, I, I have, uh, I have a, the old old playstation one that came out in 1994 i literally oh. have that sitting next to my latest xbox but that's yeah that's the last one that i i had so because once oh, halo came out uh, i saw it and i'm like oh i gotta get an xbox for this this, this is blowing my mind but resident evil comes on xbox now too so it works 